opportunity to present to be present in this territory. I've only read it a thousand times. And <laughs> still, that's just screw it up. The adoption of the agenda, please, uh, Clerk. Uh, be it resolved with the agenda for the special meeting of council dated Wednesday, December 7th, 2022, be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Grissett, Councillor Toner. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, the answer is no. Delegations and presentations. Clerk, are you going to introduce them or will just call them forward? I yeah. believe the CAO is going to start us off just, um, just a little introduction. As council knows, this is our first budget meeting for the 2023 budget. It's our annual uh, budget consultation session where we invite groups from the public and members of the public to come forward if they have any major funding asks for the 2023 period. Um, so we'll have presentations as uh, outlined on your agenda tonight and Council is free to ask any questions that they may have of, of the members, but just a reminder that we're not making any decisions tonight. We're just here to uh, to listen and, and get informed. So we'll start off this evening with the Iron Prior Public Library. Sharon Josie Scott is joining us and the work I should have strategic plan, our current strategic plan kind of expired in the middle of the pandemic. So there wasn't much point in creating a new path to the library, but we're also currently in renovations and they're in full swing. So that will allow us between a new strategic plan and our new spaces we envision it to return to full programming and uh, to work on our partnerships even a little more to make stronger community ties to create the library as that true community club. I'm sorry. We've been very, very busy. Um, population growth has been amazing. And you can see on this chart, so far this year, we have uh, just shy of 1,100 new members who have come to the library. These are new people in town, and they're people who have rediscovered the library um, since the pandemic. You can see the trend there. The highest we ever had previously was 600 and change. Um, so we're nearly double. And, and that speaks to how busy we are in the library. This past summer, we had a record, actually that's a misprint, it's 355 area children who registered for our TD Summer Reading Club. That's 40% increase over the highest number in previous years. Um, our children's programming is supported by the Scar Family Charitable Trust. They allow us not only to do the programming, but we also offer nutrition breaks for all the children for each program that uh, they come to. We have special guests, entertainment. Um, this past summer, we did a virtual coding camp with a company out of Ottawa, uh, sorry, Toronto. And uh, we partnered with other libraries in doing that one as well. We did Indigenous programs, multicultural events, and our age range for children's programming goes from preschoolers all the way up to high school. Um, our circulation statistics and pleased to report we're back to pre pandemic levels. Um, we're anticipating 139,000 and change in terms of circulation so far this year. Um, and our previous high was 2019. It's a trend that some libraries are seeing, others have, uh, are just recuperating out of that uh, COVID downturn, but we've also experienced record numbers for interlibrary loan requests and homebound delivery clients. We average of 
just shy of 30 people at any given time that we select books for and do an exchange and drop them off to them. We worked on our partnerships throughout 2022. Um, we strengthen these connections through all sorts of cultural events, as well as uh, passive type of programming, so that we coordinated an English as a second language for newcomers. It looks like our little mini UN downstairs on a Friday morning, we have people from Chile and Nicaragua and Ukraine, they're all learning English with qualified teachers. Uh, we have two seniors book clubs that we're doing in partnership with the Seniors Active Living Center. There's been requests to do more uh, book clubs in the evening for adults. Um, we've recently done a major fundraising campaign to bring in support for ADHS uh, students who are in need. Um, we've applied for a community bridge project. I'm not sure if that's going ahead. There's some funding timelines that aren't really meeting up. Um, and we have provided thousands of rapid tests for COVID and masks as well um, through the Canadian Red Cross. So one of our greatest partnerships is our donors. Uh, people drop money into the fishbowl because they pick up a cute little button that we've made or, or a nice bookmark, especially now at Christmas time. The adopt -a book program usually brings in about $2,000 to augment our uh, book acquisition. We have generous support from service clubs um, who the, the Rotary and the Optimists have always been supported and donated for our summer program, so that assists in there. Um, as a registered charity, we do give out charitable tax receipts, um, and a lot of those are targeted into areas that they would like to see that money spent. Again, the Star Family Charitable Trust has been very generous. We have a memorandum of understanding that actually is expiring in 2023. Um, they've been giving us money to go toward the capital investment at the library, as well as the support for children's programs so that we can offer everything free of charge, like most libraries do in Ontario. This year, um, we received some wonderful news that we were in receipt of an estate bequest. <clears throat> Um, some of those monies have come through in a first installment this year. The board has decided that they would like to use some of those monies for capital investments. So we're all of our shelves on our upper level will be mobile, which allows us to do a lot of flexibility in terms of programming and, and fundraising and that sort of thing. Um, Again, the strategic plan for 2023 will be paid out of that request. And then we hope to create things like reserves for technology because in five, 10 years time, Lord knows what the rate, what the needs might be. Uh, a revamp of the community room is one of the things that the outgoing board looked at. And um, so the first installment has been done and we're expecting more monies to come in in the summer of 2023. So with thanks to the town for the capital uh, investment and project management of our current uh, renovations, federal grant, library reserves and development charges, um, we look like we're on track to have all that up and running, that new expansion place indoors and later on in the spring outdoors by April of next year. That will allow us to return to programming that kind of put us on the map. Um, the space that we are adding to the library is the footprint is very similar to what we currently have in the meeting room. Um, so the community meeting room is where we used to do a lot of our artist and residence and, and children's programs and that sort of thing. We'll be able to augment that by having this outdoor space as well. Uh, live music, film club evenings, author visits, open mics music and residence, artists and residents, um, and of course our major fundraisers like our galas for New Year's Eve and Mardi Gras. Um, so these events balance, uh, balance out our budget. They augment our local um, grants and our provincial grants, and they meet the needs of the library as our size and circulation. Um, they put us on par with our neighboring libraries. Um, I can provide you with some of those statistics, but um, 
for library our size and our circulation, the annual operating budget is about five hundred and fifty to six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. That's what it works out to um, throughout the area, Renfrew County and beyond. Um, Josie's going to take over from here. All right, Karen, can you yep. do my message? Sure. Thank you. So Karen did the really, really nice part. She's got the, the feel good part by telling everyone all the great things that we're doing at the library. I have the not so great part. I think uh, picking up where Karen left off, it costs $550,000, $575,000 to operate a library the size of, uh, for a community uh, the size of Arm Prior. For, um, so the events and programs that Karen has discussed earlier provide a source of income for the library. Um, our partnerships harness the people power in our town and they build community and our programs serve the residents of Arn Prior by giving them opportunities to come together socially and with interest uh, in the music events, the author visits, the open mics and so on. But these are our fundraising opportunities. And in past years, Arn Prior Library has fairly consistently self-generated as much as $65,000 annually. And this has made up the difference in our budget between what we are able to get in terms of our um, in terms of our revenue and what our expenses are, um, I would like I would like to say that our expenses are uh, extravagant and wonderful things. In fact, our expenses are things like uh, paying for the photocopier and the telephone and our insurance. You can see on the budget list that we've submitted. So they're they're operating costs. So we generate our own funds to pay for our operating costs. Um, the stress of this uh, has has built. In 2019, we approached council at both uh, both the town and the township, and we asked for and were approved for the addition of a full time position for a program librarian to do programming and community outreach. Uh, that plan was shelved by the pandemic, and so what what the library board is asking tonight is uh, we're requesting that that position be considered. And we're calling it at this point a pilot project so that we could hire someone, a third uh, full time staff member for the library for the months of April to December for 2023 to allow that person to do our our fundraising, our um, our programming, um, all the things that ultimately will will fill the gap. Um, what we, we we looked at various ways to make them, to make up the difference in this funding issue, and we thought, well, we could ask outright for the forty to sixty thousand dollars to meet our operating costs. But we wondered if the best approach might be to have a hire for this third time uh, for this third full time worker, so that but for three quarters of the year to start with so that we could not only look at our fundraising, but also look at our succession plan. Because right now, if Karen were to leave tomorrow, we would be in dire straits. So hiring someone in, we could start training that person and putting things in place for the future. Um, another thing that we are concerned about is with the memorandum of understanding with the um, charitable trust that our children's programming funding will be coming to a close um, within the next two or three years. And so we have to look at additional funding in order to be able to carry on our children's funding that right now, up till now, has been free. Um, just to reiterate, the Arn Prior Public Library Service has steadily increased. Uh, our full-time staffing complement has not increased since the mid-1980s. Again, we can send you uh, information that would show you that our library has the, has two full time staff members as opposed to three or four for other libraries of comparable size. Um, while part time staffing has filled the frontline service demands, all additional programming and technology support and community outreach and fundraising needs have been met by our two full time employees, and the addition of a third time a third full time position. <clears throat> would help us meet not only our financial needs, but our succession planning. 
And I think perhaps it might be important to look at what would happen to the library if you didn't have that third time person, full time person. At this point, our budget holds the line on spending for acquisitions, operations, and administrations. And um, the board controlled reserves and donations augment our revenues for special projects. Karen has outlined some of them. Um, our special project for the new board, as soon as it is assigned by the town, will be to have a strategic planning event that we are using our reserves to cover. Um, and I'm um, sorry, I'm losing my place. And if we didn't move forward with the funding, the only way that the library can save money is by cutting back on hours for part-time staff. So before COVID, we had 47 hours of library, uh, public library access. Now we're uh, operating at 36 hours and we find that people are using the library a little bit differently than they did before COVID. But we might have to cut back as far as 33 hours and use the money that we saved to cover our book acquisitions and our uh, magazines. Uh, uh, I'll stop there, just say acquisitions. Um, we would have to cut back on our community outreach. There, there would be no added program programming and we would have min minimum partnerships. We'd certainly honor the partnerships that we have in place, but but we wouldn't be able to expand in that area at all. Um, as, as in past years, the sum total of municipal support covers payroll and some fixed costs, in, including insurance, audit, photocopier contracts, and so on. Um, but it does not cover the full cost of running a library. We know how much it costs to run a fire hall. And unfortunately, we also know how much it costs to run a library. We're looking forward to showcasing the library in 2023 and, and showcasing the town because of the library and its resources and the spirit that is Arnprior, that is certainly putting Arnprior on the map. And we hope that you can consider this additional request that we have in our budget as we return to the same level of engagement that we experienced before COVID. Thank you very much. I guess I can end with, are there any questions? Any questions? I have one. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. The last slide you, 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 were, you were saying that you were gonna to have to cut back what the library <coughs> currently offers. Is that, is that because you're, the trust funding will be coming to an end and you and you have to kind of shuffle around the money that you already have to cover some of the programming for the children? Yes, um, part of that is, is um, I'd like to stop working 50 to 60 hours a week, um, okay. which has kind of been ongoing in order to support this, the kind of programming that we do do to raise money. Um, our adult programming, usually clocked in at about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, but that would mean weekends and evenings plus the planning. So that I'm right now, I sound like a soft story, but right now I do the administration, the technology, the finances, the community outreach, the communications, the website, tech, uh, any of the electronic resources. That all falls in my lap because our part-time staff do frontline work, um, interlibrary loans and that sort of thing. So they, they all are tasked with very specific library tasks during the hours that they are there. <clears throat> and our children's librarian focuses on children's programming. So everything else kind of falls under my, my wing, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, so we're hoping to be able to introduce additional staffing so that we can spread it out a little bit so that I'm not going to, you know, whatever community outreach. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think it also to answer to your point about children's programming, even if the children's programming, uh, the, the uh, charitable trust could continue indefinitely, we would still have this $40,000 uh, shortfall in terms of, of our funding and the costs in, entailed in running the library. Last year, we had the same situation and we had um, a surplus. So the 40,000 was covered by our surplus and we, we asked for no further funding other than what was, uh, what was allocated. That's, that surplus didn't happen this year. And right. in the past, the surplus has been made up by fundraising. I see. Yep, got it. Tom? Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I just have a couple of questions. First one is, are you still at this time handing out COVID tests or has that stopped? No, we're still handing them out. I still, uh, we fostered a partnership with the Red Cross. And so they continue to send us the COVID tests and the masks. Well, that's good to know because I don't think that's going away. Uh, the other, where you mentioned about the three hours uh, in dollars, how much does that actually save you if you have to cut back just three hours? Uh, well, we would have, we'll, we'll have to do the, the number crunching on that, but um, if we have two or three staff, while they're there, they're not just serving the public, but they're also there doing the back end things like interlibrary loans and pulling books for homebound and that sort of thing. So if they're not there for serving the public, then they're also not doing those other tasks. So we're, we're thinking three people, three hours per week. Um, I, I, as I say, I'm going to have to do that number crunching. Josie asked me today how many hours that means, and I thought I haven't done those calculations yet. Um, so we'll. Okay, it's just, an estimate. just curious how many dollars that represented. That's all. Yeah. And um, oh gosh, so. If you don't know it, I'll tell you. No, I don't know. Did you make it three yeah, hours? Okay, thank you. Uh, just wondering about the uh, position, the pilot project, the eight month period for that, is that long enough to gather metrics to be able to say that it was a success? Uh, it just seems like a, a short amount of time to really attract top talent, knowing that it's an eight month contract. Um, my concern would be, I not get uh, the best applicant for the job knowing it's so short. Why did you go with eight months for the uh, pilot? We went with eight months because we don't know when the budget will be approved. To say that we're going to hire somebody in January, that turnaround is very tight. Okay. Um, yes, that is a concern that we wouldn't be able to attract somebody who is looking for long range, long term <clears throat> employment. Um, but we were just trying to dovetail it into what might be logistical, you know. Fair in, enough. Yeah. Well, or I'm sure the strategic plan, given the data that you've given, that would be the hope that strategic plan would support that right. on a continuing basis. Yeah. Okay. And if that individual isn't full time, then maybe part time on the assumption that that person could be full time, that the return on that placement helps. Okay, but to maintain current service standards, you really would need that third person to, to keep growing. And it looks like you've got some very aggressive uh, plans in the future that would really compromise that if you didn't have your third full time employee. Uh, or if we didn't have the money. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, no. But we, 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 we could just ask for the money, mm -hmm. but, but we're thinking asking for an, a, a third employee works into a whole bunch of things in terms of moving forward bigger picture. So so maybe next year we wouldn't back be back here doing this same presentation again. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. With the addition of a new space, will you have more revenue from more events that could be bigger and better? Yes. I mean that new space allows us to open up the entire library, the top floor. So in terms of, of major galas and that sort of thing, absolutely. But then we need the people to organize it. Um, these things just don't happen quickly. But so the mobile shelving that we are getting in December with the first installment of this request money will allow us to have a space that could accommodate 200 people. 
do a fundraising event for 200 people that will bring in a lot more money than the events that we've had in the past. Our goal is to do things like artists and residents and musicians and residents and, and writers and residents, and that will all generate money. That's the whole reason we wanted that extra programming space so that we have the community room for community groups for children's programs, and then we can do things every day virtually in that new space. <clears throat> Just a comment, if the position is approved, then the next year that increase will be part of the permanent budget, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question is, will you make this presentation to make that great site as well? We've asked our uh, trustee to talk to McNabb Brayside. So right now that, that $37,000 increase is sitting in the town of Armfire's grant increase because we haven't made the presentation to McNabb yet and we haven't received any information from our trust or the McNabb trustee who sits on the library board. Um, he was going to gather that information, but we haven't received anything back yet. So we had to park that money somewhere and we didn't want to be presumptuous by parking it into McNabb Brayside budget line on our budget without having a definitive from that. Thank you. No other questions? Well, thanks, Karen, Josie, for being here. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Armfire McNabb uh, Archives. Decision 50 yes. Is it better in the box or in a one sided <laughs> box? We'll see. We'll see. I think I need you to start the slideshow, do I not? Brian, I think you'll be able to start it if you press the little arrow button. Ah, I think we got it. There we go. Sorry about that little glitch. I think I've mastered this machine now, I hope. Uh, thank you very much for, for having us and hearing us out again this evening. Uh, we've got a lot to thank Arn Pryor for. Uh, we're 30 years old. You have been supporting us those entire 30 years. You've been depositing records. You've been providing operating grants. And you've been participating very actively and effectively in our board. And I'd just like to say that how much of an impact uh, Councillor Strike had when he was your representative on our board. It was, he was a really, really valuable member of the board and I look forward to someone who will do even better, I hope. <laughs> Anyhow, we've, we've come a fair ways in those 30 years. We're tiny compared to the library, but we are professionally led. We succeed in getting a fair number of significant project grants. We've won awards as an archives. We've got a very effective team of volunteers who have essentially all returned since the pandemic. Uh, we deal with hundreds of, of, sort of serious research inquiries that require an, an extensive response every year. Those come, some of them in person, some of them by email or phone. But we also have a much more globally and locally accessible face to our operations. Uh, we get a lot of web use. Uh, that 35,000 number is 80% Canadian. Uh, if we had a lot more money, we could buy better data, it would tell us exactly where they're from, but we've got to make do with their 80% Canadian, about 10% American. And we seem to have developed a bit of a following in China. We're active on Facebook. And in fact, our Facebook activity has taken off this year where our number of followers is up about 25%. We also get an awful lot of Facebook mentions. 
And I think a lot of that has to do with new material that we've made available on the web in, in the past year. Uh, we're still on Twitter. We'll be on Twitter as long as there's a Twitter to be on. We, we expect um, because it is a good way of getting our message out to mainstream media. Uh, we also have a presence on Instagram about which, to be honest, I know nothing. Uh, but uh, I also know that one posting can be created and with three clicks posted to all three of those social media platforms. So it's, if it's good, it's good. And we also have a website blog. Things were tough a couple of years ago. And, and some of you I know have heard a kind of our, our kind of cry of anguish at, at the worst of things in, in 2021, because for a long time, we had been able to fund, thanks to you and McNabb Brayside, three days a week of archivist time. Over time, because of the change in the way archives work, because of digitization and so on, the professional demands as opposed to the things that can be done by volunteers and sort of continued to go up. And so the archivist was falling farther and farther behind and in a situation where they could neither make a living nor get any job satisfaction, uh, we, we bled archivists for, for over a year. We, we lost two excellent archivists quite, quite soon. So we sort of went out and recruited yet another archivist and spent a fair amount of time analyzing what had changed and, and why the 21 hours wasn't workable anymore. And we presented a lot of that to council last year. And, and if anybody wants to see last year's presentation, just let me know. Um, but we came to the councils and said, we've got to get at least four days a week of archivist time. In a perfect world, we'd like five. And you listened, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and many thanks. Um, we, we came to both councils and said, look, here's what four days a week will cost. Here's what five days a week would cost. Um, make an ad raise. And, and our, our official ask was for the four days, just to be clear. Uh, make an ad raise side gave us what we had asked for. Uh, our prior council did a, a truly wonderful thing. And considering the case that we had made, said that Iron Fire was prepared to go halfway toward the, the, the five days, uh, not conditional on anything that our, that McNabb Brayside did, but just to get the hours up. So we've been operating this year with 32 hours a week of professional archivist service. And that seems to be kind of the sweet spot. That money that, that lets that happen comes mostly from Arn Pryor and Brayside McNabb. In, in a year when we don't get a summer job grant from the federal government, basically Arn Pryor gives us 51% of our budget. McNabb Brayside gives us 41% and everything else accounts for 8% of our budget. This year we got a, a, a summer job grant from the federal government. So that's pushed the two percentages for the municipalities down. But in essence, we are, the creature of the two municipalities. There, there's no kind of other way to look at it. Uh, in 2022, we didn't intend to do this, but we recruited a new archivist again, because the one that had come back when we were in the crisis got poached by the University of Ottawa, who offered money that we couldn't imagine asking you to help us match. Uh, but with the increase in hours, we were able to attract back Emma Carey, who had been our archivist in the past and, and who has been delighted to be working with us again. Uh, this year, we put 40 years worth of Arn Pryor newspapers online on our website. That's been a huge success. Uh, it accounts, I think, for about 80% of the content on the Facebook group Arn Pryor then. Uh, and it's it's a story. I mean, if nothing else, I have probably learned more about the number of gas stations that there used to be in our environment. It's it's astounding. Um, but I didn't live here when when the highway bypass hadn't been built. So 
I have no real idea. Anyway, this year we celebrated a couple of important people in, in our own history. One of them was Peter Hessel, who was the driving force really behind the formation of the archives, the, the guy who wrote the history of McNabb. Uh, Peter died in 2020 because of COVID and so on. Even though we wanted very much to commemorate him in some way, we weren't able to have an event until this summer. But we did, we dedicated the, um, the reading room at the archives to Peter's memory. Uh, both mayors came, had very nice things to say. We very much appreciated their participation in, in the event. We also want to draw attention to Arnold Mac McIntyre, a uh, legendary ADHS teacher, but also legendary archives volunteer. For 25 years, Arnold basically drove the creation and the compilation of our birth, marriage, and death indexes. And so we were all extremely pleased that we were able to attend the ceremony where uh, Arnold got his Volunteer of the Year Award this past year. We also got a great young guy this year. Uh, we did very well out of Canada summer jobs. It often doesn't work for us because we need somebody in a college program who knows about heritage and history. And we often can only get funding for a fairly short job, not attractive to someone who has to make you know, ends meet out of their summer employment. This year, we lucked out. We got a young fellow from the uh, Museum Studies Program at Algonquin, Mark Alexander Webb. Uh, he was a great, great help to Emma. Uh, we've cut our backlog quite considerably in part due to Mark's presence this summer. Uh, thousand more images online. Emma's been able to get on with processing incoming material in a way that they haven't been able to in the past. And we, we have a library board. You've got to follow us on this one. We've got our strategic plan renewed for another five years. Uh, but now we have to devote the board's energy to complying with the, Ontario, the new Ontario Nonprofit Corporations Act. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on bylaws, our kind of bylaws. Anyway, 2023, what we're looking for is stability, steady as she goes. We found that 32 hours a week works well for Emma in terms of work life balance. Uh, and she's happy with that. We'd still like to get up to the 35 hours a week in, in archivist time. And last night when I made my presentation to McNabb Brayside Council, I kind of raised with them the idea that maybe by their McNabb 200, they could get to that point. And we'll see what happens. But this year, because of the change in archivists and so on, we accrued a bit of a surplus because we had a bit of a deficit in archivist hours. And that's going to be very handy for us going forward because 2023 is the year that the other shoe drops from the extension of archivist hours. At 21 hours a week, the archivist doesn't, doesn't earn more than 30,000 a year and doesn't have to charge us HST. As soon as we got over about 24 hours a week, uh, Emma the Archivist also becomes Emma the Tax Collector. And so we are now faced with paying HST on that. It's almost $6,000 that, that the HST hit this year that we hadn't had before. Fortunately, we're able to roll that surplus over to cut back that quite a bit. And then in 2024 and thereafter, rebates on the previous year's GST, because we get two thirds of it back, uh, we'll, we'll cover that. But, but 2023 is kind of the hump year. And there are a few other pressures, but mostly it's that top line there, the, the almost $6,000 in, in HST that we have to pay. We haven't raised the archivist fee rate since 2019. We're proposing a very small increase there. We don't have directors and officers insurance, and we're getting advised by a lot of organizations that we're members of that we really ought to be doing that. 
We're looking into it. We've got a preliminary quote. We'll see what we do, but if we don't spend it on that, it's not like we'll spend it on something else. Uh, we're basically holding the line budgetarily wherever we can. Kenwood storage is going to go up. Web hosting is going to go up by an amount we don't know. Telephone and internet go up. It seems a little bit every eight months or so more recently. So in rounded terms, we're looking at $9,000 in increased expenses this year. We've got 3,000 to apply to that from the surplus. So we're looking for an additional $6,000 from guess who, the municipalities. That money will go almost entirely simply to paying people who live and work in the community. Uh, that the blue is the archivist, the orange is our administrative assistant, and that the rest, all the other expenses are in the, the smallest thing. And, and again, even the Kenwood storage is a local expenditure. So that's what, what we need. We're asking you to cover half of the increase to bring your grant up to 35. We asked McNabb last night to increase by 3,000 as well. But included in the, in the package is that more detailed budget that I'm happy to ask, answer questions on if you have any. Uh, there are a couple of non-budget things. One of them is, as I said at the beginning, we really look forward to having a counselor participate in our board and participate actively. We always encourage more links from the town website to ours. So whenever you're looking at any redos on the website, do think of us. Uh, we're working already a bit on getting ready for the seamless transfer of electronic records. And we will eventually get around to organizing ourselves a 30th birthday party or two. And we would very much like you to participate with us in that. And that basically is my presentation. And I'm Happy to take questions. Any questions of Brian? All good. Thanks, All Brian. good. Thank you. Next up, we have the Physicians Recruitment Committee. I think Mike Ladler is here to take on the Members of Council, Mayor, uh, thank you very much for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you this evening. The Physician Recruitment Committee. What are we? We are a committee that is a collaborative effort between community members, the Town of Armpire, the Township of McNabb Rayside, Armpire Regional Health, and the Armpire Family Health Team. Our mandate what is to ensure that every local resident has access to a local family physician. We are made up of myself, the chair, Karen Breslav, Sharon Hike, Robert Dodge, Ron Demers. They're all community members. Lee Lebeck, the president and CEO of the hospital. Karen Simpson, the executive director of the Armcar District Family Health Team. Dr. Diego Garcia, the lead physician of the Armpire District Family Health Organization, uh, Councillor Scott Brum from the Township of McNabb Brayside, and the Armpire Economic Development Officer. So I make this a very similar presentation to McNabb Brayside, and incidentally, we accidentally we inserted the wrong slide here. So. Uh, <laughs> I would like to say thank you to the town of Armprar as well for uh, their generous support throughout the years. Uh, you have supported us uh, since 2005 uh, with major financial support since 2011. The success of the, family, of the Physician Recruitment Committee would not be possible without your support. 
A huge thanks to Aaron Cole and Lindsay Wilson for their ongoing support as members of the committee. And I'd like to recognize uh, the Economic Development Officer position for providing support for our, our events, uh, Student Week organization, uh, student attending the student and resident lunches, uh, helping to sell our community to uh, prospective physicians and attending all our meetings. So why do we need a physician recruitment committee? So recruiting physicians is a community responsibility. Although healthcare is a provincial responsibility, uh, it is a community's responsibility to find and retain physicians. It is not the responsibility of the hospital or our current family physicians. We have a greater success in recruiting when many community stakeholders take part, uh, that, which includes physicians, residents, businesses, the municipality and the hospital. Visibility is extremely important. Now more than ever, where many communities are seeking physicians. Recruitment is a long-term strategy and physician recruitment has a long recruitment cycle. It usually takes two to three years to find a suitable physician. We are a growing community and, it will, and our needs will only increase. We need to ensure that local care needs will continue to be met and that residents will have increased access to family, uh, to primary care and in our coverage. We need to support the new physicians that we will recruit. For a physician moving to Armpar, the community needs to make sure that they are comfortable and they have what it, they need to be successful. <coughs> and finally, we need a physician recruitment committee to retain our existing physicians. We need to make sure our existing physicians feel valuable, valued for the work they do and the sacrifices that they make. <coughs> so what have been our past successes? Since 2011, we have successfully recruited 12 new physicians to our prayer. We've replaced four retiring physicians. Since 2016, the family health team had a combined roster size of 12,000 people. Currently, the roster size is over 15,000 patients. This is a 25% increase. And the Physician Recruitment Committee has helped keep our community healthy by attracting physicians and minimizing the number of people without a family doctor. Since 2016, when the waitlist was created, there have been over 6,000 people who have found a family physician in our part. The renovations in Suite 157 and in, in 2016 and the Tall Pines Clinic uh, in the New Grove in 2021 uh, have helped us uh, attract additional physicians to our part. And we have raised over $160,000 in community support since 2011. Our last recruitment successes with physicians are, have been Dr. Megan Fannin and Dr. Samantha Kremer. Uh, they are both graduates uh, of the Ottawa Medical School and they're both uh, from the Ottawa Valley. And that's what we have found has been the greatest attraction, uh, the greatest asset in, attract, in attracting physicians here. People that are familiar with the area or are from a small town or have a similar background. PRC have provides financial support in the form of relocation support, startup costs, including moving costs, office setup, office supplies, and business setup. We do not provide cash to physicians for them to locate in our prayer. We provide them with support such as medical equipment or for help setting up their business so that they can get to the work of practicing medicine rather than worrying about how uh, they can set up their office. So what are our challenges? As many of you know, if you read the news, healthcare sector is extremely fatigued during the pandemic. Doctors are now considering retiring earlier. They're reducing their practice size. They're not increasing their practice size um, and they're adjusting their work-life balance. During the pandemic and and uh, this past year, there have, we've had fewer medical students doing rotations in our prior. And rotations are our main way of recruiting newly graduated physicians. There have been fewer career fairs and it's harder to engage students in an online forum. We have had fundraising challenges. 
Uh, we couldn't, our main fundraising event is the Doctors Dining Duel. We have not had that in the past two years and we have pushed it to next year, to June. Our biggest challenge now is we, our wait list is now 3,000 people. Last year, it was 50, it was half of that. So we are a growing community, which is great, but this impact has been 1,500 people more on the wait list. And we just see this increasing because uh, Arm Prior is a growing community. Another very large uh, challenge for us is the lack of uh, suitable physician space. Newly trained physicians uh, operate in a group practice with other physicians. Uh, established physicians who are considering moving their practices prefer to practice in a group practice. Many are for physicians who potentially who could potentially retire over the next few years. Many of them have standalone practices, and it's challenging to recruit new physicians into that space. Currently, ARH has no vacant space for physicians, and the new space that was created as part of the growth redevelopment is full. Uh, we have a recruiting physicians, as I've mentioned, is a very long recruitment cycle. It takes two to three years from the time to that we make contact with someone to when they actually begin work. And lastly, retiring physicians have large practices. New physicians are looking for work-life balance where they see fewer patients work less time than their archetypes of many years ago. In addition, the administrative burden has increased over time, allowing for, pay for physicians to see less patients. Many physicians who are uh, getting close to retirement have large practices that will require two physicians to replace them. This means we will need to work even harder at recruiting multiple physicians to replace one physician who retires. Our current physician need. The family health team wait list, as I mentioned, for, uh, has 3,000 people. This is approximately three or four physicians. We anticipate that we will have three retirements over the next five years. That brings, this translates to a minimum of six additional physicians that the community will need. There are no official retirements at the moment, but with a long recruiting cycle, we will need to continue our efforts in order to um, ensure we have a smooth transition between those four patients whose physician is retiring. We remain an underserviced area, Arm Prior and the rest of Redford County it has been designated by the Ministry of Health as an underserviced area with the need for additional physicians greater as you uh, go up the valley. And there are new developments in both Arm Prior and the Mad Brace side. So our, we expect in the future that our needs will only increase. What have been our recruitment activities? What do we do to retain, to recruit and retain physicians? We, may, we, retain, we maintain relationships with medical schools and student placement agencies to ensure that the flow of the students and uh, residents come to our part and uh, we can glean potential candidates for uh, physicians that way. We hold resident lunches where we have an opportunity for committee members to speak to the physicians and see what a one-on-one -on -one to see what their plans are for permanent practices, get to know the physician and see what they're looking for and if they will meet the needs of our community and if we are a suitable community for them. We host student week each year where new medical students come and we show them what it's like to practice in a rural community. We attend career fairs such as the, at the University of Ottawa, which was held uh, just a few weeks ago and also at Queens. And we continue our efforts to recruit physicians for the anticipated retirements. We coordinate our annual doctor's dining duel and craft shows to raise funds. We continue to show our appreciation to our existing physicians. And as mentioned, we are planning for new, new uh, group space. We are looking at the future for additional group space to attract new physicians and offer the best possible space for healthcare in our community. Our 2022 recruitment activities, we saw nine residents complete rotations with local physicians. This 
uh, but the pandemic continues to affect our main recruitment efforts. Uh, in the past, we have seen the number of residents through have been around 20, but it is still an increase over last year. We had two students during uh, student week. Again, in the past, we usually had six. Um, we celebrated Doctor's Day in May. Uh, we, had, we hung banners at the hospital and in the primary care center and uh, offered snacks and treats to the physicians in the, from the hospital cafeteria. And for doctor appreciation in November, again, we hung banners. Uh, we had coloring book pages uh, paint, posted uh, that were painted, that were uh, colored by local children, uh, hung around the, uh, the primary care center. And we uh, are providing a small gift from physician recruitment to our doctors to thank them for their ongoing uh, work in the community. So our funding is a combination of the generosity uh, of the Township of McNabb Rayside and the Town of Arm Prior um, and our annual fundraising activities. We're currently in uh, currently on budget or under budget in all of our uh, areas. Our financial goal for the Doctor's Dying Duel is to raise $10,000 in 2023. Our budget for 2023 allows for the hiring of one additional physician. And our uh, total budget is $50,000. So this supports uh, our position recruitment coordinator role, uh, which is held by Mel Mary Meltmore. Attendance to, to at three recruiting events, the continuation of student lunches, retention activities for <clears throat> current physicians to show them how much we value, value them, and to, and to make sure that our recruitment efforts don't go to waste. Our request to the town of Armcar is for $20,000. We will also be requesting uh, the same from the township of McNabb Rayside. And this $20,000 request has been the same since 2016. So what's next? What are we planning for the future? We are planning for our group physician space. We want to make sure that we have space that will serve our community over the next 5, 10 to 15 years uh, as it relates to recruitment physician and uh, re physician recruitment and keep keeping our community healthy. We will maintain our efforts to recruit physicians to reduce the, the wait list and, our, and the anticipated retirements. We'll continue our doctor's dining duel, which is our main fundraiser and has been a hit for the community. We'll be attending career fairs, coordinate uh, and continue to show our appreciation to uh, our current physicians. Is there any other questions? Questions? <clears throat> when it comes to the planning space, are you just finding, um, kind of connecting them with the actual space and then it's up to the fit or wherever have they decided to team up? Uh, to purchase, to outfit it, to do all that. How, how do you fit into that role? Of um, we help with uh, bringing all everyone together to uh, explain the needs, explain what uh, physicians are looking for, what new resident, what new residents are looking for, and how uh, they like to practice. The uh, hospital, uh, it, we are in uh, discussing with the hospital and the many partners that exist there. Um, with re, redoing the space uh, in the primary care center uh, to allow for additional group space. So uh, redesigning some of the uh, spaces that have individual positions in them and creating a group space, similar to what's in 157 or uh, 257. Um, and uh, that will allow, it, by starting there, that will allow us to um, create new space within the hospital as physicians retire and uh, create a cycle of, um, there will always be a new space for uh, a physician. Um, we have lost uh, opportunities uh, for physicians who have decided to go to other communities because we don't have uh, space. Um, we recently, have, recently had a physician uh, who practiced in our, uh, who was here as a resident and uh, they declined uh, practicing here because the space that was available to them, uh, that would be available to them was uh, single 
position space and they wanted to practice in improved primary space. So it'd be reallocating the resources they're creating yeah. at the hospital, not necessarily new building. And uh, no, not, not at this time. We're not planning that. Okay. Where we go. Yeah. Mark, is there any hope of uh, taking over more of the property of the old road? Uh, I can't speak to that directly, but I understand that um, the hospital has uh, has already made some plans for that, and that's not there is no opportunity for uh, in the near future for that um, for, for a physician. So. And to put another rumor to rest, the medical center at the old liquor store. Uh, that would be great, but I have uh, have not heard anything about that, so I I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none. Thanks, Mark. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks for keeping us. Next, we have the Iron Power Regional Health Foundation. Ben Gardner speaking on the behalf of the So first of all, thank you very much to the Town of Armcar staff. Thank you to the councillors. Thank you to everybody who's here as guests. Um, my name is Ben Gardner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Armcar Regional Health Foundation. So our primary purpose as a charity is to support the purchase of life-saving equipment for Armcar Regional Health. You may have seen uh, in the news recently that we received approval for a CT scan at the Armpire Hospital. This is great news for the residents in Armpire. A CT scan involves x-ray images taken from different angles around your body and uses computer processing to create cross-sectional images or slices of bones, blood vessels, and soft tissues inside your body to create an image, a 3D image, so that, you know, in a perfect world, a physician can better diagnose you and see it in a three dimension. So currently, if you come into the Air Prayer Hospital, whether you come into the emergency department or visit your family physician, the doctor or physician has an option to use an X-ray or an ultrasound. So these are both you know, uh, great pieces of, of life-saving equipment to diagnose and, and better treat any illness that you have. But if they need something that's a little more precise and detailed, then they need to order a CT scan at either Renfrew Victoria Hospital or Queensway Carlton Hospital. So this means that, you know, the patient or resident who's at the hospital needs to leave their community and go either travel themselves to another community, uh, a community that they're not familiar with themselves, or they need to be transported. So this involves, um, you know, a delay in diagnosis and treatment, obviously takes them out of the environment that they're familiar with. It means that that patient, um, like I said, their, their diagnosis is, is delayed, the treatment is changed, and care is, is changed altogether. Quite often, if they're transported, um, it involves a nurse to accompany them, which you know takes away from uh, human resources at our prior hospital um, when we know that staffing shortages already exist. So this here, this slide here is a perfect example of this situation. So Jill Favreau was sick for more than a month. And after finally being admitted to Arm Pro Regional Health, his physicians ordered a CT scan at the Renfrew Victoria Hospital. So based on the results of that CT scan, doctors determined that he had gallstones and treatment was therefore followed Again, this was a lot of stress and expense and inconvenience for him and his family. His diagnosis was delayed 
but ultimately he had a, a positive experience and outcome and he's now at home happy and healthy but again outside of his community that he was familiar with So what's the impact on arm for our residents and patients? So when we have a CT scan in our prayer, 3,000 people, just like Jill, who are currently referred out of town for a CT scan, will have this test in our prayer. The stresses and expenses from travel will be eliminated. There will no longer be a delay longer wait times or disruption in diagnosis. <laughs> One thing that I, I personally didn't consider myself, um, we recently uh, had Dr. Morrison, a retired physician in our prior, come and speak to our foundation's board of directors. She said that a CT scan is actually a perfect recruiting tool. Of course, we're, we're pretty lucky in the town of Armprior. We have some amazing physicians. Um, but as you know, Armprior is a growing community. Some of those physicians are retiring. A CT scan is a gold standard for doctors who are coming out of school right now. And this, you know, ideally we're, will persuade new physicians to start their practices in Armprior. In this slide right here, this is uh, Dr. Florin Padianu, the Chief of Staff at Armpire Regional Health. He's a huge advocate for the CT scan campaign, and he knows that a CT scan in Armpire will lead to a faster discharge and provide physicians with the ability to continue quality care right here at home. In this slide, it captures uh, the endorsement of Dr. Terrence Woods. So Dr. Woods is the emergency department chief. I really feel like he's the face of emergency medicine in our prior. Um, he's a real rock star, in my opinion. He sees value in a CT scan because it keeps patients local, where they're comfortable instead of taking their, them out of uh, our community. So just to back up a little bit, a CT scan will give physicians the depth of the information to properly diagnose many conditions. And some of these conditions include certain types of cancer and benign tumors, fractures, heart disease, blood clots, bowel disorders such as Crohn's disease, brain and spinal cord diseases or injuries, internal bleeding, kidney stones. This adds to the exemplary care that Armpire Regional Health already provides and reinforces our commitment to a healthy and vibrant community. Again, just to reinforce the value of a CT scan right here in Armpire, this will reduce wait times, decrease our hospital's financial burden, from referring patients elsewhere. It gives our hospital a greater ability to recruit new physicians, just speaking to the, the physician recruitment piece. All of this while enhancing healthcare for our prior residents. So it's planned in the first year of having a CT scan. Like I said before, it will address 3,000 people who come to the Air Prayer Hospital, whether that's the emergency department or their family physicians, but it also adds 3,000 people who are part of a backlog of people waiting for a CT scan, whether it's at the Renfrew Victoria Hospital, Ottawa Hospitals, Queensway Carlton, et cetera. So 6,000 people in total using a CT scan. So when is a CT scan coming? So we know that after a construction contract is awarded, the equipment will be installed, renovated, and operational within 18 months. It will be located in an existing space in the diagnostic department at the Armprior Hospital. 
So knowing that information, our foundation shows a timeline to launch a two-year, $1.8 million campaign to fully fund the project with the help of our partners, local businesses, and community members. We know that the town of Armprior, your staff, your council have all been extremely supportive for many years. We wanted to respect your goal to enhance the town of Armprior by coming to you and including you. We current, we're currently in the quiet phase of this campaign that began on December 1st. We've had quiet conversations with a couple partners so far, and there really has been a consensus that everybody's excited for this campaign and having a CT scan in our car. We know that our prayer regional health, our foundation, and the town of our prayer share the same vision. We're all working to enhance the quality of life of local residents by delivering great health care and services for everyone. We would like to respectfully invite the town of Iron Prayer to join in the success of this campaign and invest $200,000 over a four year period so that we can make sure that great health care stays right here in our prayer. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this great news and for your consideration. Questions for Ben? Tom? Uh, just um, for operation of this, do we have staff now that will operate it, or is this uh, additional training that they would have to take or whatever? Yeah, so there will be additional training that, that is included in that $1.8 million uh, campaign goal. Um, we may have to hire staff to operate the CT scan or uh, to train the people that already exist in the diagnostic department, but it is included in that $1.8 million campaign goal. <clears throat> Uh, just you, you said which question? <laughs> okay. yeah. um, you said it's really important for recruitment. Just how key would this be um, in supporting recruitment efforts? Uh, like how much would that help their recruitment? Uh, I don't know if it's measurable. Um, I feel like it, it, it's a great argument um, for people who are considering being physicians in our prior, it's something they can add to their tool belt. Um, you know, it's a great way to try and sell someone, you know, having the space like, like physician recruitment was saying before, but having the tools as well that they can use to make their job easier to diagnose and treat. Okay, so it's almost, my question really is, it's an expectation that communities have equipment like this to, to bring in that top talent, like do they expect to have access? <clears throat> Uh, ready access to a CT scan. Yeah, so I, I feel like all of the literature and research that I've, I've you know, seen previously, um, it is the gold standard, a CT scan, having it available in your hospital, uh, not having to refer someone to a different community to, to have those tests. Okay, great, thanks. Oh yeah, uh, Ben, by getting a CT scan in the, the Empire Hospital, I mean, you said that the doctors or the physicians in town don't have to uh, refer a patient, let's say, to Renfrew Victoria Hospital. So with that, do uh, who pay who pays for the patient? Who pays for the use of the CT scan if we have to refer someone else? Like there's. Does, does our physician, does our hospital pay? How does that, or does that hospital, they just get the money from the government? Yes, so they get the money. The difference is um, when we refer someone, if they need transport, we would pay for the transport. We would, you know, fund that nurse that needs to accompany them. And that's HR taking away from our, our hospital as well. And, you know, with uh, staffing shortages, you know, the way they are now, it's, one person in the hospital that, that has to leave temporarily. Yeah. Okay. I mean, not that it's like not that you're 
not that we're always trying to um, getting a CT stand. It, it it would be like a revenue generator, also, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Um, so it's important to note that the ministry will not be providing any funding for operations, but it will generate revenue. Um, and there will be a slight <coughs> surplus of revenue generated because of the CT scan. That's right. okay. Good. Any other questions? Just one that Ben, with the 200,000 that we're going to give on the 1.8 that leaves you a million and something, can you express how we're going to get that kind of money? On your, your the draws, where is this money going to come from? From well, where is the two hundred thousand dollars going to come from? If, yes. if we give two hundred yes. and it's worth one point eight, you're short one point six million. Yes. Where is that fundraising going to come from? The additional one point six. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we've already quietly spoken with uh, some businesses, some local partners, and community members in our prior. We have a lot of interest, a lot of people who have committed verbally. Uh, so we're we're on our way there. We we haven't, by all means, haven't uh, fundraised even verbal commitments for that one point six million dollars. But we know that you know, based on our previous campaign, the five million dollar campaign for the Grove redevelopment, there's a lot of generous people in this community. There's a lot of very generous business businesses, community-minded businesses. Um, you know, it's just a matter of going and providing an opportunity for them to be recognized and thanked and, and give back in a meaningful way. Thank you. I guess where my direction is with the money that may or may not come from the town, that's our taxpayer. And it's going to be the same person that's going to be part of your fundraising. Right, just to let them know there'll be double dipping per se. We're certainly in favor. Thank you very much, Ben. Any other questions? None. Thanks, Ben. Much appreciated. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next is the Emperor Airport Commission. Uh, I'm getting this out here. I guess I'll just give a brief uh, introduction. It's uh, John Constantinesco. People I go by Johnny, so uh, I've heard all my friends call me Johnny in a creek as you saying. I'm uh, new to the position of chair of the Arm Prior uh, Airport Commission. I have also taken on the role of uh, manager of the airport right now. We had a, uh, our current manager decide to leave, and uh, it was left with no choice but to uh, kind of pick up the slack. So I'm kind of being the judge, jury, and executioner uh, all in one swoop. Um, however, uh, I figured uh, I was going to start the presentation with a with a meme, if you can imagine uh, a married couple embracing like the top reading the best moment of my life with a plane flying by behind. And if you read the lore section, I'm in the plane. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm a passionate aviator, aviator. I'm a I'm a father of a four year old and a two year old. Uh, and we're also local business uh, owners. And we also live in the Arm Prior area. So we're all looking these kind of close to home. Um, just to kind of continue on here, is this ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, I figure you can't really talk about where uh, where we're going unless you talk about where we came from. So I'll try to make it brief, but it seems a lot of people don't quite understand what we have in our own backyard. So to discuss briefly, this it was a British uh, Commonwealth training facility that started in 1941. And uh, in uh, 1942, it was a station our prior opened uh, as a number three flight instructor school. At the time, had a roughly 64 aircraft, 46 students, and uh, had staff to over 800 people. The uh, instructor school closed in 44, uh, having pushed out almost 400 instructors. And uh, then it took on some other roles. The airport took on other roles afterwards from 46 to 53. The NRC operated uh, a flight research laboratory. Uh, they subsubsequently left and moved over to Ottawa because their runway length wasn't enough. 54 to 71, the Emergency Preparedness College was there. It's obviously uh, gone as well. Boeing was, uh, was around, now became uh, our prior aerospace. Uh, and in 72, the three uh, uh, Arm Prior, Renfrew, Braveside, McNabb, they formed a commission to develop the uh, South Renfrew Municipal Airport. 
And then finally, in 1984, this commission was incorporated uh, and it was sold for a dollar uh, to the commission of the crown. Now, um, let's just speak briefly about who we are at the airport. We're passionate aviators, we're community members. Uh, we're volunteers, and not only at the airport itself, we're uh, often involved in the community and, and fundraising uh, for various um, uh, charities. And we're also fathers, uh, uh, we're, we're mothers, we're parents, of course, with children, and we're looking to get the community involved in things as well. This is on a little note, this uh, presentation was made to have a bunch of moving parts which don't appear to be taking place in this current rendition. So if things kind of look a little bit odd, that's why. Um, moving on, who we were not, we're not a bunch of rich guys that are, uh, you know, with their toys, which often I feel is, uh, is what's being portrayed about people at the airport, that it's just their toys and we're out there playing with the toys, the big, 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 uh, you know, sandbox, so to speak, for adults. Um, no, we have, we, we know that, you know, uh, there are, we live in a community, uh, we respect the community, uh, we don't have deep pockets to just run, uh, you know, to run an airport. The uh, guys often, believe it or not, there are aircraft that cost way less than the cars that you guys drive. So uh, this is not, uh, you know, don't play, paint us all with the same brush strokes, uh, saying that we're, now of course there are people that have planes that have money like this, but they're also, you know. um, this is kind of how it started. Uh, the self uh, Renfrew Municipal Airport uh, it started with all three giving $25,000 a pop for a total of $75,000. Uh, and eventually Renfrew decided to leave. Uh, then McNabb Brayside decided to leave and Arm Prior took over and gave uh, $60,000 a year. Uh, not quite the 75 that we had, that they started out with, but that's what you guys could come up with. And, uh, and of course, this has been going on for, for decades. <clears throat> what we've become today and what we contribute to our prior, uh, we're currently 43 private hangar lots and it's growing. Uh, there are currently some under construction. All units pay land taxes, including uh, lease land and some are at commercial rates. So not only at the uh, residential rate. Um, all landowners do have a vote. I also voted uh, with the uh, vote from the from my uh, land ownership that I have at the airport. Uh, the um, it, I consider it a minimal municipal expense for the town of Arm Prior because we don't really engage in any of the services that you guys offer, including fire, water, sewage, road maintenance, snow removal, et cetera, et cetera. So it ends up being a net positive for the town of Arm Prior. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about the kind of businesses that we do have running. Uh, we have a commercial lots that are available on the north side of the runway and one large contract or lease that was signed with SSI Canada, um, was, who is a large communications and energy company based in Northern Canada. Uh, they work with indigenous communities and provide competitive uh, and accessible internet and energy solutions. And they're interested in coming and have, um, uh, committed to coming to Arm Prior to develop um, working with uh, First Nations communities via aviation training and education. I like to make kind of a disclaimer here. This is not their official position. They haven't come up and said, I did try to ask them before this presentation if they could give me a little mm -hmm. bit more that we could work with here. Uh, but it ends up that I, I wasn't successful. Uh, we only ended up speaking a little bit too late. So um, we also have Parachute Ottawa, which is a world class parachuting facility. Uh, in terms of employment and when it brings, there's 20 plus employees that operate during the summer months. Of course, the winter months are a little bit uh, quieter or in fact don't operate. Uh, six are residents of Arm Prior. In fact, that was just uh, updated this evening to eight, two, two more have moved in. Uh, this year alone, 2022, there are 800 first time jumpers that came to the town. Um, on an average weekend, there are about 400 jumpers and spectators, that, so it's jumpers and spectators together. Uh, the majority travel from out of town for the experience. So this brings, of course, the trickle down that you would get uh, with, uh, you know, support of local businesses, restaurants, uh, food, fuel, tourism, et cetera, et cetera. And they reckon or they've averaged about two and a half spectators per jumper. We have Mobility Lab Incorporated. I'm sorry, that's a, that's a, it's a little bit difficult to read. It was uh, supposed to fade out here, but uh, so they're a globally recognized uh, and, and a trusted parachute company. Uh, they have 15 employees, uh, 12 employees are residents of our prior. 
they average two to three specialty military training courses a year. So they're training in over 20, well over 20 personnel uh, per course for specialized training in parachute jumps. And uh, in 2021, so I don't have this year's figures, but in 2021, they had spent over $400,000 in meals and groceries locally. <clears throat> we have an aviation repair facility, an AMO, called Chapman Aviation, who also does flight training, uh, who began in 1986. Uh, he's Transport Canada, Transport Canada approved, they employ four to five full-time staff, all local. Uh, they full service repair, maintenance, and certification facility for aircraft. He also offers flight training for both land and seaplanes and he does city tours. Frequent flyers at the airport. I'd uh, like to make a little bit mention of who likes to use the airport and how we benefit from them and how the town benefits from them. OPP for street, uh, strategic operations, uh, search and rescue, finding those lost loved ones that are uh, being difficult to find, uh, frequently strategizing the terminal building. So you can walk in there, you can see OPP often gathered uh, in the terminal building discussing how they intend to uh, carry out the operations at hand. Um, one example, in fact, I saw them uh, a week and a half ago talking about a lost individual that was close in the area and they had provided aerial support for, for this. We have Hydro One Networks uh, doing system inspections and strategic maintenance, damage assessment, uh, grid development. And uh, just to give an example, during the last high wind event a few, a few months ago, we had about four uh, Hydro One helicopters working around the clock. Uh, looking to see how to restore power to this area and to our neighbors. And uh, of course, all sit and planning in, in the terminal, making use of the facility as well. <clears throat> Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources does uh, firefighting, environmental protection, and wildlife management. It also loves to use our empire as their temporary base of operations when they're doing um, uh, missions in the area, if you will. The latest example is we got a phone call in about uh, about three weeks, about a month ago now from McNabb, uh, who asked whether or not we had any airplanes in the area. And uh, we said, yeah, uh, what's the problem? Uh, we, they said, we have a fire right, right near White Lake. There's no road access. and would like to know what's going on. So they need some reconnaissance. So uh, there was a plane about to take off. They got on the radio. Uh, they gave some information, which was helpful. And it ends up that they dispatched the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources over the next couple of days. Uh, with personnel that was dropped down uh, into the area for access. Now, what they did with it, I didn't, I didn't ask, but uh, it's certainly a, a resource. Uh, last and certainly not least is uh, Orange Air uh, Ambulance. Uh, they routinely operate at Barn Prior. Uh, we have uh, for patient transfer and for emergency, uh, you know, extrication or, or to you know move people to get the service that they need um, when time is critical. I um, invite you all at least to think about what it would be like to have a family member that, uh, you know, or a loved one that requires uh, critical care where the minutes count and the seconds count. Now, of course, there are definitely towns and cities that don't have the luxury of having an airport in their backyard, uh, but we have it. Uh, if we were to start it from scratch, I think that uh, it, would, it would be outside of the reach uh, of, of, uh, of our current uh, municipality. But we have it there and it does bring a huge value in terms of, uh, of what it brings. To give an example, in the last, uh, in the last week and a half, there has been three um, activities where this, is, this was just taken last week, where we have uh, ambulance out on our apron and we have helicopters uh, taking people to get the service that they require and the ad that they need. <clears throat> where we're heading, a snapshot, uh, I would like to say that we're going to be certainly working towards further commercial development uh, in our allocated lots. So we have some um, lots that uh, the one side reaches uh, Van Dusen and the, uh, sorry, Bevshaw Park Bay and the, and the other side, well, between the two. Uh, and the other one uh, has a access to our decommissioned runway. So we have these commercial lots that are one acre in size that we're trying to uh, find uh, lease, uh, leases or to fill leases for. Um, private hangar development on the north taxiway, I guess I don't have a map here to show you, but our taxiway uh, effective, our main taxi runs pretty well north-south, and on the north side of it, um, there is a huge area to develop key hangars uh, that we're looking at, and we're also looking to do, or I'm looking to, to increase the amount of general aviation attraction, which would include, let's say, underwing transient camping, 
for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a thing to have uh, planes show up with tu tourism, uh, set up a tent underneath your, your, uh, uh, underneath your wing, stay for the night, use uh, local resources, and, uh, and be on your way. You may or may not recall, I wanted to make this, make this a part of the presentation, but uh, time constraints didn't allow it. But we used to have very um, involved flying in breakfast a number of years ago before my time in the area, but uh, 2011, I believe the COCA 33 was one of the largest um, uh, flying breakfasts that had taken place. We had served, I believe, uh, almost 1,000 breakfasts. And this was not just from aviation. There was uh, there were certainly many planes that showed up, but um, by and large, it was the locals who had showed up. And we've gotten um, many, many questions about when is this coming back again and when should we get involved? So. That's something I'd like to bring back, and I'm making uh, some strides in order to, to, to bring this back. Uh, and I'd like to get our prior residents involved. Uh, so either via COPA 33, or there's another organization called the Experimental Aviation Association. Uh, we have a chapter that's out of CARP, who may very well be interested in working with us over at our prior, where we can offer flights for youths. Uh, anyone who's interested in getting involved in aviation or want to know what it's like uh, and want to get exposed, they're free flights, and um, uh, we take them up and hopefully get them, you know, whet their appetite for, for aviation. Challenges. Uh, airport has many, but um, no uh, CapEx. So capital expenditures, we really don't have a lot in the coffers for what kind of expenditures this type of, uh, um, uh, this type of infrastructure requires. So uh, for instance, uh, the runways are, are, are a big one. If we had to repave the entire runway set, we'd probably be into the millions. And uh, we certainly don't have the coffers for that sort of thing. Operating expenses have increased, just like everywhere else. Uh, we're certainly no exception. We have, uh, uh, you know, not only has fuel gotten more expensive, so we kind of notice that people want to fly a little bit less, but uh, there's also, you know, everything. The snow uh, operating budget wants to increase um, everything that we have going on at the airport definitely just increase. Um, definitely a challenge is an environmental consideration. I think that I should, we can't only talk about the good things with the airport. I have to at least acknowledge the fact that the airport must be seen as something that uses fossil fuels. Uh, we burn quite a lot of it, uh, both uh, for the private guys and certainly for the commercial ones. I don't even want to put a number on it, but it'd be staggering to realize how much helicopters use and large aircraft. Now, we're not, um, you know, we're certainly not an exception. And there are airports that use a heck of a lot more. Of course, you know, Ottawa and, and everything is that have routine um, jets that come in. However, I feel that at least for uh, what we can do moving forward, we're strategically placed, in my opinion, where we can, uh, you may or may not have read that there's been some electrification of aircraft, at least for short-term use. Uh, in a, a, a small radius around an airport. We're well placed for that because of the amount of uh, space that we have. Uh, if we were gonna get into somebody who's interested in pursuing electrification, we have hydroelectricity right at our back door, so we don't have to worry about coal and the implications of these sorts of things. Um, the possibilities are endless. So I just wanted to touch on that, that uh, yes, of course, this is something that, uh, that is a, a problem, however, um, it doesn't look like aviation is going away anytime soon, perhaps much to the, the dismay of some environmentalists. Um, aviation, in fact, right now is at, at a bit of a critical level where people are definitely looking for pilots. There's a huge shortage of pilots and it's difficult to get them to get trained. So we also have that angle as well. Uh, what am I going to do about it? Personally, I'm going to say that I'm trying to cut labor costs for the airport uh, with regards to overhead now that I've taken on management and we don't have a, our only full-time uh, employee was our manager. Now that he's no longer, um, if I do any management work personally, I, I only charge by the hour. Uh, it's if you maybe we call some of your other present, uh, pres presenters rather uh, that if you charge under $30,000, you don't have to charge GST. I'm definitely in that bracket. So uh, if whatever little I do for the airport on the management side, uh, it's just an hourly charge, which saves the airport quite a lot. Uh, it ends up that our management uh, wasn't performing very well in the last year or so. Uh, and um, this way here was something that's certainly able to, uh, to, to reduce. And you'll see that in the, uh, in the balance sheet that I provided. Uh, and we're looking at increase of director workload. So we have, um, for those of you who don't know, there's uh, six, 
uh, directors that are on the commission, and I'd like all of them to maybe pick up the pick up the pace a little bit so we can all contribute to the airport and take on tasks. Uh, so kind of have a dual role there. Where we're actually getting our hands dirty as well. Uh, I'd like I'm going to implement implement rather the first ever volunteer snow contract for the airport in order to cut costs as well. So I'd like to get a, a volunteer team. Uh, you guys probably recall that we purchased the uh, truck from the town. Uh, we've got it running uh, suitable for our needs. At least I hope we haven't pushed any snow with it yet, but I'm, I'm hoping that'll be the case. Uh, we've got our hands on a snowblower, I believe, that used to actually work at the airport for a very, very reasonable price. Uh, so there's a couple of pieces of machinery that we're going to require moving forward. But if we can get enough guys together, we can really cut the uh, snow, snow removal uh, down. And I'm hoping also do a better job. Uh, there's been some complaints by some of the uh, guys who've moved in that uh, maneuvering spaces have been very uh, slippery. And, uh, and I'm hoping that with what we got together and with our dedication that we'll do a better job. I personally try to lead by example. I'm trying to do a, you'll easily see me on there. Uh, as I said, I'd like to volunteer for snow, but all past this past summer, I've been operating the tractor, doing cutting the lawn, all volunteer, uh, crack filling, uh, operating these propane melted. Anyway, uh, I've been doing that for, for many, many weekends. Uh, I'd like to increase fees for people that are there now. So this will, of course, uh, help our bottom line. Uh, with regards to fueling, we currently have issues servicing transient fuelers, which means you know people coming from elsewhere that wanted to slip a credit card and pay like they would at any other fuel pump. Our fuel system does not allow it. Uh, we're looking to make that change, and I'm looking to at least get the increased revenues from that. And finally, uh, with regards to accounting and bookkeeping, we have a, a system that, uh, quite frankly, um, I have no positive words to, to use to describe it, but it's very difficult to work with, uh, will suffice to say, and I would like to, to change this system in order to get to, first of all, help some transparency, but also to help uh, a better analysis for how we can uh, better uh, keep our costs in line at the airport. What are you supporting and why? Well, the crux here, infrastructure. I know that this uh, the airport is not a piece of uh, an asset to the town of Armprior. However, I believe it's a de facto town asset in the sense that it, it, it exists because of the town. You guys have been supporting it for many decades and, uh, and it's called the Armprior Airport. And um, although I would like to consider us an arm's length, I very much want to strengthen relationships with the municipality so that we can all work together and just consider it a resource. Um, the airport operator, which is the Armprior Airport Commission is um, volunteer. All of us do not get paid. So it's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, you don't have any to worry about salaries. You don't have to worry about anything that that entails. Uh, so it comes at very low cost for the, uh, for the town. Our land tax dollars translate to net positive for the town. So all of the taxes that come in that, uh, as described before, via either private or leases um, are all, they come to the town and you certainly get more out of it in taxes than, uh, than I, I don't have the exact number, by the way. I looked. To, to obtain that number, I spoke with Oliver and he said that that's, uh, uh, I guess, confidential information. And I, I was able to, I'm able to get the information through MPAC and, and kind of come up with a number for this presentation, but I thought that it would probably be fudging some numbers anyway. So I think it's a suffice to say for what we're asking, 55,000 versus what you get, definitely get more than, than what we're asking. Uh, and in addition to the trickle down and direct benefits of, uh, you know, to the local economy. Also, um, it's a minimum uh, relative expense for the town. We don't have any sewers. There's no pipes to fix. There's no road maintenance. There's road maintenance. Uh, no snow removal, which is certainly a big one. Or street sweeping. We don't even have any lighting that you guys have to pay for. And uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, in, in terms of a piece of infrastructure, uh, an airport starting from scratch would be unattainable if you're starting from zero. But right now, you have it in your own backyard, and uh, and it would be. I'd like the council at least to consider the airport as an, as an indispensable resource, simply for that matter, that it does provide a real, real tangible uh, benefit to the town. And uh, if that's not enough, I'd like to work together to sweeten the deal if it wasn't sweet enough. We'd like to offer, I know that the town has been looking to uh, get a dog park and has been in conversation for quite some time. We have quite a lot of land. 
and we are willing to offer some as long as it doesn't affect uh, our the safety of airport operations to a dog park. Uh, we there's a couple of spots that we had uh, that have potentially that, that could work. It would really depend on your analysis and, and your consideration, but we're willing to work with you on that for uh, you know continued support for the town. And that's that will conclude my meeting. Are there any questions? I have a question, but it's it's more for Jennifer. Do we have an approximate idea of how much tax revenue we do receive from the hangers? So from all the presentations tonight, what I'll do for council is I'm going to combine all of it into a nice memo and have all the information, and I'll definitely get that for you, and I'll include that. Last day, dog park. Yeah. Um, you're willing to offer the land. Are, are the volunteers up there going to look after it as well, or is that going to be an expense well, I, for the municipality? I, I would imagine that'd be for those. So what, what, let's give one example. Uh, out at the end of Baskin Drive, there's a dock there. That's uh, There's a parking lot at the end that a lot of people might do some interesting activity because there's really garbage and stuff around it. But if you look at that area, let's say you're cut out or carve out a, a one acre area for a dog park or whatever it is that you decide we work or we work together at, that would have to be fenced. That would have to be a municipal expense that we don't have the expense to fence that sort of thing. And I would imagine that the, it would be under, understood that the municipality would clean it, provide garbage, you know, that, that sort of thing. We could probably take care of the snow for you. But outside of that, I mean, I don't think that if you're suggesting that be out there picking up, you know, what what what, what I, remains may be there. I not not myself anyway. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I I just have sort of mixed feelings on dog parks because for that very reason, right. is town staff going to be expected to clean it up? And I don't think they should be. Right. So I think it should be anyone users user fees or users do it. I uh, just I just don't agree with <clears throat> that being. Put into the municipality for staff to have to pay. That's just my opinion. That that's fair. I, I just I know that I've been watching at least uh, uh, not not a focused uh, observation, but I have been looking for a while, and I noticed that it has come up a few times, both in social media and also you guys have discussed it. So I think it's if it's not on the agenda, at least it's you can hear the drum beating that I think somebody wants a place. At least that's the impression I get. I'll leave that to you. This is your domain, but I'm just saying if it's something that you want to work with, we're here to listen and help. Any other questions? Yeah, just with Dr. Um, if we were to look at that, if that were an option, uh, what kind of time, because there's going to be investment for fencing for that kind of stuff, what kind of uh, contract or what have you, how many years would you be interested in? I, if I, I mean, it's hard, it's difficult for me to answer that as, uh, you know, uh, definitively, simply because I, I I, I'm not. I'm a unified voice, but I certainly have to speak for the commission. And that's what we should probably discuss first. But but I think we're open to anything, really. Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of land, and the way an airport operates generally is that they, you need the space for uh, like a, with regards to expansion. It wouldn't be in the room of expansion should that ever be something uh, down the line. And uh, I believe that we're contractually obligated uh, to operate as an airport if the commission is to re remain. So. For the in the long term, we're hoping that this is going to be an airport. So, listen, if if it, if it helps the municipality, then we're here to work with you. And uh, and I think that's uh, you know I, I, if, if if it if it helps, then and you'd be interested. It, well, you can't commit to it, but a long term commitment wouldn't be off the uh, not off the table at all. No. Okay, that's good. Thank so you. I I mean I can speak. Sorry, just to say, add one more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I we certainly talked about it with another couple of the uh, directors in the commission, and in fact, it was one of the uh, their ideas to do this. They said, why don't we work with the town and and have make this happen? So I I really don't see any impediment to uh, to working long term. You know, 20, 30 years. I mean, I. I I, as I said, don't don't hold me on it, but I, I think it's definitely not hard. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Jeff. No problem. Any other questions? Oh, Chris? just a yeah, just a comment. Uh, I certainly commend your efforts for um, trying to cut costs by, uh, with the uh, by. I you know, and also increasing the fees for the leaseholders so i just wanted to put that out there that's 
um, I certainly commend you and and thank you for putting those efforts uh, forward. Well, thank you, yes, Chris. I, yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And, and it's a uh, it, it's a long road, and it's uh, not an easy one. But I I think if uh, at the right goal, I think we can all make it happen. And it's uh, I really appreciate your comment. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Just a comment. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, I really look forward to the dog park. If it's a uh, Okay, with the airport commission, but the council is making a decision on where and what we're doing and all the different rules. But thank you very much for the offer. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. All right, thank you for your time. Next, we have the Ontario Winter Games. Good evening, uh, uh, Your Worship and, and, and Chair. Uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to make a presentation uh, this evening to you and to your staff and, and your volunteers and your community. Uh, we uh, are very proud of what we've been able to accomplish on behalf of the community. Uh, as, as you're aware, the uh, games were originally due to happen in March of this year, but uh, uh, COVID forced us to make a decision last year, uh, which was the right decision to delay. Uh, and the government uh, in discussion allowed us to reschedule uh, to this year, which is a, an off year. Normally it's a two year break. So next year it will be in Thunder Bay in, in 2024. So with that tonight, um, Cindy Burwell is with us. She's the Games Manager. She's been with us uh, since uh, pretty much since it started. <laughs> um, we, Cindy or I did not submit the application to the provincial government. Uh, it, was pre it was presented by a number of recreation directors across the county and, and county economic development and tourism department. And after the games were awarded, I was approached to chair it, and then we in turn hired Cindy. So Cindy's our only our only employee. The rest of our our group of volunteers. And so with that, I'll just turn it over to Cindy. Thanks, Peter. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for giving us the time to present in. Um, I think we did this this presentation about a year ago, almost to the day. Um, this time we're feeling much more optimistic going forward that these games are actually going to happen. I, I'm going to open just by reading this quote because I actually think it's pretty powerful that um, is by Nelson Mandela so what isn't powerful by him but sport has the power to change the world, it has the power to inspire, it has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. I'm just going to leave that with you, that thought, because we speak to that a lot going forward about the power of sport, about inspiring our youth, and about unifying the whole Renfrew County and bringing our communities together, which is really why, um, why our region actually bid on hosting these games. Uh, just a little bit about what the Ontario Winter Games are. They began in 1970. Uh, they happen every two years, and they are the largest multi-sport event in the province. We will see over 3,000 athletes, coaches, managers, and officials coming to our region for the two weeks of the games, um, competing in 24 different sporting events. And that includes both able-bodied and para-sport. The athletes on average are aged about 11 to 20, and this is their very first entry into elite competition. So this is kind of the first time that mom and dad are dropping them off and, and waving to them. We take care of everything once they're left at our doorstep here in, in our county. The parents are around from a support point of view and from spectators point of view, but this is really, for these young athletes, this is their first big entry into elite competition and anything that sort of emulates Olympics, Pan Am Games, Canada Games, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's an exciting moment for them. Um, and for a lot of them, it was a big disappointment that it didn't take place last year. The games are in fact owned, there you go. The model of the games are owned by the province. I, I sort of think of us, we're a franchise that is executing the games on behalf of the province of Ontario. Um, so it's the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage. They provide the funding, uh, or sorry, the initial funding. They set up guidelines for us. They provide us with templates from previous games. And they we work closely with them on a daily basis of, of overall management of the games. Um, we provide the infrastructure. So our role as host of these games is to provide all the infrastructure that would be needed to host these games, the venues, 
um, the facilities. We have to seek out, in some cases, some of the sport equipment, whether it's uh, wrestling mats or karate mats or uh, racing gates for any of the Alpine events. We provide the people that will help put that infrastructure together, the volunteers, we provide the accommodation, we provide the transportation, and we provide the food for the athletes, as well as gifting medals, all of that has to go into our budget. And so basically, as I said, the athletes come and we take care of them from there on in. What we don't do as an organizing committee is we do not select, we don't choose the age groups, we don't determine who will get to participate in these games. That is the provincial sport organization who makes that decision. And they also provide the actual officials that will be officiating any of the sports. We just pay for them. <laughs> uh, Peter pointed out, uh, we have a committee that runs these games. We are in 16, uh, 16 different chair roles. We actually added a chair role, so we're technically 17. Um, we wanted a sustainability chair because we want to ensure that these are sustainable games and that the, the impact on our region is minimal, as minimal as we can possibly do. It is 100% volunteer run. As Peter pointed out, I'm the only paid staff that's working on this that oversees it. Um, my chairs work endless hours and have been for almost two years now because of the delay. And uh, we're so excited that it's finally going to happen. But it, it is an incredible accomplishment to think that the games of these magnitude is virtually done by a volunteer committee. In terms of Renfrew County, it's the first time it's been hosted here. And it's the first time that these games have in fact taken place over multiple communities and in rural villages across the region. In fact, it's probably the first time it's really been out of Southern Ontario. It's traditionally been in Aurelia, Toronto, Barry, uh, Barry London, that region. Um, in fact, when we toured around with some of the sport reps, they're so excited to be able to actually go somewhere different than Southern Ontario all the time. So it is, it is the first time. It's never happened. We are literally in 17 venues and nine communities. The biggest, the, the biggest region I've had before was Barry Aurelia. So imagine the distance between Barry and Aurelia versus the difference between Petawawa and Arpar. <laughs> There's a big difference. So it's taking place over two weekends as well, which is unique. That's never happened before in these games. Typically they happen over a three-day weekend or potentially a four-day weekend. But the sheer magnitude of the number of people coming and the number of hotel rooms that we can provide in our region, uh, we just couldn't do it. So it had, we had to split it into two weekends. So we're virtually hosting two separate games with a group of athletes coming one weekend and an opening ceremonies and a group of athletes coming a second weekend with a second opening ceremonies. There are 24 different sports. That's just a snapshot of them. It is a mix of sports that are traditional Alpine, uh, traditional snow sports, such as you know, skiing, snowboard, cross-country skiing, curling, speed skating, um, sled hockey, ringette. But it's also a mix of sports that are, for whatever reason, and in fact, when we think about it, I don't know why sports that are in a gym are some considered summer sports versus winter sports. There's really no rhyme or reason to that, but it is the Olympic model. So we have sports, a lot of martial arts, uh, judo, karate, wushu. We have sports like um, wrestling and weightlifting, uh, artistic swimming. So a lot of sports that we don't, you know, traditionally think of as winter sports, but for no other reason that that's been the model for the Olympics, I would think. That's a snapshot. I'm sorry, it doesn't come up very clearly on the screen there. Unless Job again. I don't know why it's not quite the whole thing. But anyway, we um, that's a snapshot of where we are across the county. So we are uh, Barry's Bay, Deep River, all the way into Armfire and every and all the, the major communities. We're basically along the Highway 17 corridor for the most part. We have a couple of sports that we had to move into Canada and Nepean simply because we didn't have the infrastructure in our county to host those sports. So one of them is bowling. Um, which is had to be hosted at Maryville Bowling because they need 24 minimum lanes. And the other speed skating, and that is because they need an, um, an international sized ice to host the speed skating. So we couldn't host that there. Peter, I'm going to pass the vision and mission to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so when I was asked by uh, the warden and, and uh, some conversation with the minister about taking on the chair's role, I said, look, you have to know a little about me. I have a chip on my shoulder, quite frankly. I think our community can do anything. Uh, we just, sometimes don't have the confidence to do it. And so I said that, you know, that's going to be our approach. We can do anything, we can do complex, we can do, we can do uh, you know, artistic, 
we're good at what we do. We've got the volunteers, we've got the resources, and, and we're going to show it. And so the, the vision statement is quite it's quite uh, aggressive. It says to implement implement a winter games of such high quality that it becomes the gold standard for future games while promoting Renfrew County's a thriving, growing, and diverse community. So we wanted to say to our kids, even if you're not an athlete and you're going to be a future athlete, here are the opportunities for you. Here, here are 20 plus sports that might interest you. And we also wanted to, to send a message to our volunteers. Our volunteers can do anything. We can think big and then start planning and do it and find the resources to do it. So that was the message we wanted to send uh, first to our, our athletes, our soon to be athletes, and then also to our volunteers and to our community. And then secondly, we wanted to bring in economic development. You'll see a future slide which talks about the benefits of the county. Cindy mentioned the um, the two weekends part was we want to keep as much money in the county as possible. So that meant double booking rooms on both weekends. And, and if we fell a little bit short of our volunteers, our numbers that we were looking for, we felt that we could double shift some of them. They have such a great time working for us that they want to come back. And so uh, and our mission statement is it's essentially to showcase the county to all of Ontario. And the participants have a high quality, memorable experience. Um, we think we've got quality facilities and we've got friendly, helpful volunteer staff. And that's about their common goal that they're working towards. And so why the games? As I said, it was so celebrating together as one big community and it's to generate community pride and spirit so that our community will take on other events. We've been approached about some other significant events once we get this one wrapped up. Engagement of all 19 communities, we felt is important. Uh, the county and the city have a good relationship and, and of Lompkins of the Kowakum, but on First Nation, we have a, good, a, a great relationship as well. We wanted to make sure that all 19 communities uh, were a part of this and benefited from it. And we want to leave behind an important legacy. And you'll hear a little bit about our legacy project. Part of our the franchise is that we have to leave uh, 100,000 in the budget to develop a legacy uh, that's going to benefit the whole community. That's going to be sort of kind of tough, but we think we straddled that uh, straddled that razor blade, and, we'll come, and we have something we want to talk to about in a minute. And as I mentioned, the economic boost to the region, and we want to inspire and motivate our youth. So how do we measure our success? It's through the participant experience. We're going to be spending some time uh, talking to participants. We're going to enlist all of our, our mayors and the county councillors to hit the, all the venues and ask questions and talk to people and act, act as goodwill ambassadors to, at all the venues. Dan may not be aware of that yet, but that's <laughs> part, of, uh, part of the Peter plan. Uh, and sustainability, we, we uh, one of our, Donors, our sponsors is Aqua, and they donated uh, uh, 5,000 metal water bottles. So we'll be giving them to everybody, the volunteers and participants. So that's one of our sustainability initiatives. And we're going to try and get all of our food packaged in, in paper as opposed to plastic. Uh, we're going to, in essence, ban water bottles from, from the sites as well. So those are things that we're, we're going to do. Uh, the visitor experience, we have a, an app uh, that we're going to have online so that when people come in and, and uh, they've got a couple hours they can, can uh, log in and find out some destinations in the county to, to go and look at with some experiences for them. Diversity and inclusion, again, uh, we're, we're welcoming everybody and we're and some of our, our participants will have some mobility issues or, or site issues. And uh, that's part of it is to ensure that they have a, they have a, a pleasant time and a, and a rewarding experience as well. And then the legacy project we're gonna to talk to you about in two minutes. Games and numbers. Um, so we anticipate about needing about 750 volunteers. In reality, that could be as high as a thousand volunteers. Uh, it kind of depends on how many choose to do two weekends or just one. But um, we're still that's we've already since since it was launched uh, the games about a year and a half ago, and we launched an online portal to register. We've had over 600 people already signed up and and so that's that's without even them knowing what's going on or what was coming so we're we're feeling confident about that we're working with the school boards across uh across the county uh to you know get students engaged get their their volunteer hours um it's so that that's a, a, a big part of it um we have a thousand managers and coaches we have talked a lot of this already and we anticipate about five thousand visitors so if you think there's 2200 athletes if the majority of them come with a couple parents maybe a grandparent brother or sister um we know there will be some carpooling because we know they're coming from far distances in some cases we have, we have athletes flying in from thunder bay 
Um, so they won't necessarily become a parent. So I got a call from a parent today who's booking a flight from Thunder Bay. So, um, and largely estimated a $5 million economic impact on the region on across the county. Um, we will be measuring that too. It's also a requirement of hosting these games that we actually measure the impact of it. Uh, another sort of slightly different look at it is about we're working at about 25 hotels, so 3,000 room nights, about 20,000 meals. We're working with 10 different bus companies. We, the, the county bus companies actually, as everyone is well aware of the shortage of bus drivers and the, the local bus companies are, are, can't cover all of our needs for this. So we've had to go out and seek other bus companies to help us. And we hope to raise a minimum of about $25,000 in merchandise that are producing for the games. Budget overall, so this is an interesting one. <laughs> it's really why we're here today. Um, so Games Ontario, which is the ministry, basically gives a million dollars to initially seed capital to host these games. And that was what was part of the original bid, which was done probably four or five years ago. And then that interesting thing called COVID landed in the middle of this. And we know the impact of COVID has been in, uh, massive inflation, increased food costs, et cetera, et cetera. So, we have now anticipated our real budget, our real is going to be between 1.8 and $2 million to host these games. Where do we get the revenue from it? As I said, it's about one, we pleaded to the Ontario government that 1 million was not gonna cut it. And so they last year, even before the games last year came through with up to an additional $400,000 to host these games. But keep in mind by delaying one year, we we spent some money obviously in initial year. So we probably lost about 100,000 of money that's just, gone because of postponing by one year. Um, and then of that as well, we have about $100,000 that actually goes to a legacy fund. It doesn't have to be 100,000, but somewhere in that range, we need to leave money for a legacy fund as well. So we have to make up a rather significant shortfall in sponsorship, in in-kind donations, in uh, in-kind offer of, of facilities of different types of things. Um, there's also participation fees which interestingly enough has not moved, they have not, that's the province supplies a small participation fee to all the athletes. To give you an example, for three days, uh, each athlete pays $115 for three nights accommodation, all their meals, gifting all the officials, every all the transportation. So that's a very minimal and it has not increased since I think 2016. So <laughs> the, the, the participation fees is minimal and so we make up the shortfall through, um, through sponsorships, donation, and reach out to the community. We have an incredibly generous community. Um, we have, of course, raised this objective of 400 to up to 500,000 that we would need to raise over and above um, the seed capital that the, the province provides. We've currently closed, um, at the time I submitted this document, which was now over two weeks ago, about $275,000, and we had at that point, about 65 uh, ready to sign, and I think 40 of that has now been signed. Um, we anticipate, and Peter will tell me I'm low here, but, but probably closer to $50,000 in donations that are coming through, and we're in the process of talking to different companies. So um, we're well on our way, and this is across our communities has been very generous, but we still have a gap to fill. We still are, you know, we're still looking to close about another hundred to $200,000 to ensure that our, our um, our budget is met. Um, otherwise, we're going to be doing lots of cutting, but uh, we're feeling really confident about that. We've been really active in the community. We have a donate button, and I think some of you may have heard we had Domino's pizzas out there working for us. So the community has been extremely, extraordinarily generous, and we're now trying to cross that finish line with, with minimal, um, with not a minimal, with an excess, because we, we, if we have any kind of an excess, of course, it's our legacy fund. It's only going back to support the community after this. And it's important to know that we are far exceeding any other games in history in terms of what we've raised from a sponsorship point of view. The, I think I was told Aurelia was what probably the next highest and they raised $50,000. So we have a very generous community here, which, which is as amazing when you think of the, the breadth and the, the size of this community, how they've come through. Uh, this is just some of the partners. Again, we've actually closed more partners since I submitted this document, um, but these are some of the partners we have on board. You see the majority of them are local. Um, you know, Rogers and Desjardins are two big sort of uh, uh, Canadian-wide sponsors that are interested in our community and interested in having a visibility here, but for the most part, our sponsors are, being, are, are from our regional area. 
Um, Peter, Peter can also speak to Renfrew, the town of Renfrew itself, which are not listed as a sponsor, but have come through um, in a big way. Yeah, we, uh, the town is uh, is giving the uh, Mattaway Center two weekends in a row for going revenue uh, and then not charging fees. And then we've also had staff time in terms of, we've added in, in a uh, cross country skiing at the Mattaway. So we had to brush a bunch of trails so that our staff has done that. They're also going to help out uh, and host the, uh, the VIP tent uh, both weekends as well uh, for the opening ceremony. So I, conservatively, I think our the town's commitment has, has been in the neighborhood of about, about 25,000. I promised them I thought I would keep it under 30. So mm -hmm. I've been <laughs> working diligently to keep it under 30. Um, so that, you know, when we've had, it's been a good response from uh, from the town and, and, and we're hopeful it will, uh, you know, we're, we're had a wall in actually here, so we've got a wall to talk to them as well. So what's up in our car? <laughs> that's what's relevant here is so um, we have two sports taking place in Armfire. Um, the decision of where a sport is hosted is really also we present opportunities to the provincial sport organizations who came and did a tour of all the facilities, we tried to select the facilities that made the most sense based on there was a club there, they had the, the, they had the appropriate venue to host it. Um, thus, Ringette is here in Armfire, we held at the Nick Smith Arena. Uh, Ringette is one of the biggest sports of the games. Um, it also attracts probably the most parents, <laughs> the most loyal parents who are coming along to it. We anticipate 130 athletes, uh, 10 coaches and managers, 31 officials, 30 to 40 volunteers will be working at the event. And I, I grossly estimated about 500 spectators daily um, at the event. Uh, and again, Ringette, because our fire has one of the strongest Ringette programs in the region, then so it makes sense to host that event here and uh, also a great facility with the next fifth arena. The other sport being held here is a sport nobody's heard of, but is actually a spectacular sport, which is Wushu. Someone has told me it is most similar to uh, Kung Fu. There are two elements to Wushu. One of them is performance and one of them is combative. Um, I can't tell you more than that except Google it because it is quite fascinating to watch. It's a little bit like artistic uh, gymnastics combined with martial arts. Um, they are a really keen group. They actually want to host an event in the evening and invite the community out to come and watch it. They want to do a lot of different things like it. So it's going to be held at the at the high school. Again, about 130 athletes at one of the bigger sports as well. 20 coaches, managers, 11 fish, officials, 30 to 40 volunteers, and about 500 spectators. Both school boards have been generous. They're not charging us uh, significant fees for the, the schools that we're using. All of our events are free. Spectators can come and watch them for free because we want them to be open and accessible to the community. So what we have tried to do to offset the cost then is to get a sponsor of an event. So we have, for example, um, OPG has, is sponsoring sledge hockey, which is taking place in Petawawa, the civic center there. So we get, and that way it offsets, we don't need to charge the, the public to get in if we have a sponsor that's covering it. We haven't got every sport console, uh, covered yet, but for the majority of them, we do have Ringette, we do have a few other sports at the, we're just trying to give some visibility to sponsors and not have to charge any uh, addition fee. In terms of the local economic impact, we virtually are booking every hotel in the region in our prior. Um, as just for the athletes and coaches, we are filling the Quality Inn and the Galilee Center. Um, in fact, we have to do a bit of a juggle where we have athletes staying here, sometimes have to stay in Canada so that we can, you know, there's a bit of a juggle of rent for athletes have to bleed into arm prior. <laughs> so what we try to do is minimize the distance that anyone has to travel. Uh, the other hotels will be in motels. I haven't listed them all, but would be filled up with the with parents and, and families. There's literally not enough hotels in the region for everybody um, once we fill them up with athletes. So um, every single hotel room will be filled in the region during those, those, uh, those two weekends. There's also, we are using local catering companies um, for the athlete meals. Again, we have to feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, in a lot of cases, we're using that, we're doing at Nick Smith Center for the lunch and dinner, and then bringing any local caterer who will assist with that. Um, and then for so athletes that are staying here that don't have facility at visiting parents. So I've grossly estimated that the impact of the region of uh, specifically arm prior would be about 150,000. That's based on hotel rooms and food, but I, I'm kind of guessing that was, it's, it's a, 
I wouldn't say it's I pulled that out of a hat, but I did some some very quick math on that. Um, I would actually estimate that's probably quite low on what the real uh, economic impact will be. What are our challenges? Well, pandemic was a big one, um, and postponing the games had a huge impact on our current budget. The sheer geography of these games, it's its so massive. So you can imagine that the transportation costs with current transport, the fuel costs, um, the shortage of bus drivers, um, we're kind of at the mercy of bus companies to charge whatever they want because we have no negotiating power right now. Um, so the sheer geography, inflation again, of course, there's also some donor and volunteer weariness. So, um, you know, we've been lucky so far. We have a lot of volunteers and donors are stepping up, but uh, there's no question that um, there is some weariness with respect to that. And labor shortages across the board has had a huge impact on that. So, um, you know, for the, for the catering companies, the bus companies, everything, it's, it's been a huge impact on these games. So here's our request. It's not a big one. Um, we really want the Nick Smith Center. We'd love to have not have to pay a fee for the use of the Nick Smith Center and consider this as a form of sponsorship for the Ring Ad event. Um, I, I put a value of approximately 10K. That was really based on last year's figures. We're not using um, both rinks this year. So I spoke to Graham before the event and we'd be looking more. It's actually more about $7,500 if we were to rent it. And uh, we're just, our request to you is just, could we please waive that fee and um, have access to the next center for the ring out event for the duration of the games at no charge. Uh, just final slide is uh, the benefits. Well, the benefits of hosting these games is that, you know, our car is obviously part of the biggest sporting event. It's a promotion of Armpar to a wider community. It's engagement of your local population as volunteers, as hosts, as, um, as vendors, as store owners and restaurants. Promotion of all your venues and local tourism and, and then just generating pride and spirit in, in the Armpar region and, and just having the opportunity to be a part of these games. That's... And we may, uh, we may reach out to you to um, some of the other things we've been asking and, and we'll be at is uh, sandwich boards and, and heaters, uh, you know, the, the tall specific propane heaters, if you have those kinds of things. I'll be sending a note out to the municipalities in the next little while. We need about 20 heaters and I think I have five lined up right now just to by like, sussing around the communities. And so those kinds of things, sandwich boards, uh, we have a lot of signage that we have to put up at various venues. So we're wondering what we're going to subside. So sandwich boards are putting our, inserting our signs. Up. So the, we'll send out a little shopping list in the next little <laughs> while. Um, uh, and one of the, and if you would consider also the the loan of one of your half tons and, and, and an employee or volunteer uh, for a day, uh, the two days before the event, uh, before it starts February 2nd and February 9th. We have to move a lot of stuff around the county. There's podiums and there's uh, uh, supplies to different venues. Uh, and one of the things we're, we're trying to cut back on it, and it's going to be difficult, I think, is to rent enough vehicles and put them with volunteers. And then we're a bit worried. Uh, most of the rentals don't have snow tires. They're all seasons. And you know, somebody driving an unknown vehicle to them, we're a little worried about our liability. So we're going to reach out to our partners to ask you know, we think we're going to need about 10 half tons uh, uh, for seven days uh, of each week. And we're going to try and work it out if we can borrow a half ton and an employee and we'll provide a volunteer to help with loading uh, to move some stuff around. So we're, we're still sort of sussing that plan out. I've been doing a lot of driving the last little while, trying to look at routes, trying to figure out times, and, and so is the logistics people as well. So those are the kinds of things we're going to be asking for. I know it's a cost, uh, you know, but I, I, sitting as a municipal councillor, I'd much rather have a cost that I can absorb as opposed to writing a check. So that's that's our way of trying to uh, trying to sweeten the deal for you. Uh, but that, those are the kinds of things we'll be sending out as a shopping list in the next little while. And so we've had just we've had great cooperation from your staff here, Graham, and and and, uh, and your staff have been awesome. We've had people in and out a number of times looking at the venue. It's, the PSOs trying to, you know, and we move some things around and they've been most accommodating. So we, we can't say enough about your staff, uh, your, your rec staff, and then also your, your staff here under, under your CAO. I just wanted to add to, um, we, we, we sort of touched on the, the legacy project, but it's not really included in the presentation, but I just wanted to explain 
what we as a committee came up with because because the county is so big and how do you preferentially with the legacy project choose which county or which region is going to benefit from from any um, money and and how to you know how to make sure that we touch everybody so we came up with the idea of something called a sport, a sport for all fund and the idea is to remove barriers to participation in sport so what we want to create is a fund which ultimately will be an association or a foundation eventually but um, is a long-term fund that would support every community across the county um, to remove barriers to participation in sport. And those barriers could be financial. So an athlete uh, or a young child or whomever have, can't afford ski equipment or hockey equipment, but is actually really good and can move on to the next letter. They could, they could apply to the fund to get funding for that. Um, I know sledge hockey has just started up in this region here in, in our part, you know, what about another team in another region if they want to apply to get the fund to get equipment to offer a new sport like sledge hockey, or in the case of Renfrew, where we put, we're putting in cross country ski trails just for the event. Maybe they want to create a, um, something that offers cross country skiing to the communities going forward. So that's the idea behind the fund. And it's also to provide infrastructure improvements because one of the things we noted in doing all the site visits a year ago is that a lot of the facilities in our county are not actually accessible, are not truly, truly accessible. So um, some have, you know, the Pembroke Curling Club, as an example, spent money to make it accessible for wheelchairs to enter the facility, but they haven't made it accessible for someone to actually participate in sports. So there's no ramps to the rink. So <clears throat> Brentford Curling Club was the opposite. You could actually get on the rink with a wheelchair, but they have no accessible bathrooms. So we couldn't host wheelchair curling anywhere in the county. There was not one uh, curling rink in Renfrew County that was deemed to be accessible. That's just one example. So that is another thing that we want the fund to be able to be help our, our region to be more inclusive of any athlete that wants to participate. And so literally any community individuals would be able to apply to this fund. So I just wanted to clarify that when we talked, we kept talking about this legacy, but I didn't really explain it in the presentation, but that was, that's really what it would be at the end. And that's what our goal is, is to ensure that we do have this money that we don't have to eat into the legacy fund to help offset any of them uh, if we go over on the budget. Now I'm really done. Any questions? <laughs> I promised it was going to be quick and short, but. <laughs> questions, Chris? Uh, for any volunteers, local volunteers that still want to get involved, do they go to your website? Have they? Uh, yep. They can apply? go right at County 2023ca and you click on volunteer and it takes you right to the registration portal. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just wondering with any additional costs for like policing for traffic control, if we needed that, who would bear the cost of that? Would uh, Ms. Fowley would? So we have uh, the, the only real one we need policing, and there's two things. is one, the opening ceremonies, which are being hosted in Renfrew. And I'm not sure where that sits in the budget here, but. Um, oh, it's uh, one of those things that I'm straddling a fence on trying to figure out how to make it work. But yeah, it, um, ultimately it, it's, it's going to be covered under our, our, our Games Ontario or Winter Games budget. Um, and uh, some dark, stormy night in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have a conversation with our Treasury Department to see if there's some means of making that work. Okay. So, yeah, the really the, the key area that we have is for the opening ceremony, like just traffic uh, control, because we have so many buses that will be leaving all at the same time. Um, and then the other area is that we provide security in the hotels every night. So we have a literally, um, so so we have a security budget, which in an essence to answer your question, and then we have we have paid security that literally will be traveling around to the hotels and making sure that we have those or something. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Under slides, I know you mentioned all the motels and hotels. The night's in wasn't mentioned, but I know I I, I just in the room. On the uh, on air to give everybody the same sure. advertising per se. Uh, home support has mobility vehicles. Have we reached out to them? Uh, Sunshine Coach and a couple of them through the network, and we uh, we've had some conversations with the airport. Um, the struggle for them is they don't have the excess capacity uh, to take away from their their own business of the day, and most of the events. Uh, run from uh, you know approximately nine in the morning until seven at night or six thirty. So we're in the process of, of having more conversations, but 
Um, most of them have said, yeah, I, I, I can't promise you because our, our, our traffic flow was up and down or, or our client flow. Um, maybe, but don't doubt on us is kind of the message we're getting. Just to, we have a home support and we yeah. have a number of, I say a number of vehicles, but we have a number of vehicles that could be or should be available. Excellent. Then, and the last question was with accommodations under private. Um, if you are a referee and you're only one person, could we build them in the person's house for the weekend? Technically, no. Again, this is not our rules. This is uh, Games Ontario rules, is that we need to provide a hotel. It has to be a billable type of venue. Um, we are encouraging Airbnbs for family members that are coming along, but for the most part, for the officials and that sort of thing, we are technically supposed to be putting them out of hotels. Thank you. Can I, Chris, can I just ask one, just out of curiosity, for our prior, we had the ringette. Um, you said that you have about 170 participants. Mm -hmm. I think that was 130. Yeah. 130. So are they each part of like a like a team already or, or how are the teams selected? Is the province broken down into areas and play the best yeah. players from each? Exactly. Oh, okay. So it's um ring is actually unique and they have a really neat uh process actually, which I really liked, is um they are actually selecting kids and putting them on teams. So you could have kids from Thunder Bay playing with kids from Arm Player, playing with kids from I Arm and, uh, and from Ottawa and putting them rather than selecting a regional team, they are selecting athletes and then mixing them all up, which I think is a really interesting idea because these kids are now getting a different experience of playing with different uh, different kids and also with other coaches. But they're the only ones. Hockey, on the other hand, is going regional. So there's the Sudbury regional team, the GTA regional team, the, you know, the Eastern Ontario regional team. And, and But again, because there's selection, these kids don't necessarily play together on a regular basis. But... Um, but we have nothing to do with that. That is um, how they're selected and how they're placed on teams is all the provincial sport organizations who do that. We simply host them. <laughs> and the last question is, people that are issuing pizzas at the schools have to have the vulnerable police check. As a new volunteer coming to the Ontario Games, do the volunteers have to have the police check? So we have, uh, yes, <laughs> in a nutshell, yes. Not everyone, our rule of thumb, and we have Brian Shutt as our, uh, and his next OVP, he's our security chair, and uh, we're working closely with the province on this. Anyone who is in regular contact with children, um, so all of our medical staff, our security staff, all of our sport management staff who's, you know, in around the facility, has, they all have to have some vulnerable sector checks. Yeah. So if you're working in traffic or if you're uh, helping us with our food uh, uh, preparation, preparation, you don't have to because you're not in regular contact. So we kind of go through the organization and, and take a look at all the positions that are out there and say these are the ones. So I think of our expected 750 volunteers or 1,000 volunteers, I think we're, we're about 120 or 160. No, more than that. It'll be close to 500. Okay. Well, be required. Yeah. And so we, we tried to rate who has to have that? Fortunately, you can do it online now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a much quicker process. And we've also, um, we're trying to set up a process. So a teacher who has a vulnerable, has a, you know, obviously has it for their day-to-day -day job. Um, or, or we have a process in place that we don't have, they don't, we're not requiring them to go get a second fund. So. All good. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Peter. So uh, thank you. And just before we leave, I, I'd like to, uh, Express my appreciation to Dan. Uh, he, he represents the community very well at County Council uh, and asked a lot of good questions. Dan and I have served on a number of committees the last four years and in the next four years. Uh, great asset for your community uh, and his contribution to, to the county and to the things that we do. It was greatly appreciated. So I just wanted to reassure you that you said the best and we certainly appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, we did go to Toronto. Yes, we yes. The county rent crew, and we were well, right. well received. <laughs> yes, we did. The county rent crew did that. <laughs> Thank you. Last but not least, Judy Kobus is joining us from the uh, Seniors Active Living Center. Um,
I'll go on the end. <laughs> Glasses, contacts, here we go. <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity to um, speak to you about Sierra Living Center. And um, I believe most of you are aware of the SALT, which is primarily located downtown with um, other uh, venues where we also offer programming. Oh, it's on slideshow, it's going to advance. Is there a way we can go <coughs> slide by slide? And so for those of you, actually, I should have introduced myself because you may not know me, although you know self. So I'm the manager of community programs at our Empire Regional Health. Um, SALT is one of the programs that I manage. I also oversee the Community Assisted Living Program and the Adult Day Program, um, which are both located out of the Old World building. And so SALT is a place for seniors to participate in social, educational, and recreational programs. It is a partnership um, between the Ontario Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility, who is our main funder, Armpire Regional Health, the town of Armpire, and the township of McNabb Rayside, where I was last evening to present as well. And we're also a member of the Older Adults um, Centers Association of Ontario. And so, um, as I mentioned, our funding comes from the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. Yearly, we have to apply for that funding and we receive a grant. Um, we also follow the program guidelines. So within those guidelines, it is stipulated in the legislation, municipal support um, is required for the maintenance and operating costs of the SALT program and is mandatory for us to actually have a SALT in our park. And so for programs that were approved after 2008, which would have been our SALT, a minimum of 20% of the net annual cost to maintain and operate um, is required every funded year. That might be new for some of you. And so our yearly fee for members uh, is $35. We are we have um, agreed that it, as of April 1st, our uh, fee will increase to $40 a year. And if you wish to uh, join the men's shed, it's an extra $20 a month for supplies. And so with membership, uh, we have about 300 and 50 people right now who are actively um, SALT members. You receive a little key card and you receive discounts at some local retail retailers in town. Um, I think it's 20% off of white pine books and you also get uh, rewards at the golf course, coffee shops. Um, and I believe we've added a few more. I should have updated that slide. But um, So yeah, there's many advantages. It's a win-win for everybody you get to uh, shop local and um, you know get your programming and uh, many free programs out of salt. Not every program has extra fees, but there are some that additional fees are required because we have to pay instructors. And we have a salt advisory committee and Chris Toner sits on that committee. At this time, we have salt staff, community representatives, someone from seniors at home, um, the townships, our car regional health and members from our men's shed. Okay, we can skip that one. Oh, there we go. So our programs, very varied. Here you only see really a handful of um, what we do offer. We know that seniors throughout our community we try and plan our programs depending on what they want. And some people are huge card players and they will show up for bridge for cribbage, for euchre, for six-handed euchre, um, and others enjoy dominoes. Um, we also have crafts, flower arranging, book clubs. We partner with the Empire Library. We offer shuffleboard out of the uh, Jag in Grayside. Um, what's been really popular, I guess, it's safe to say that um, pickleball is now sort of replaced Zumba. Mm -hmm. It's really, really popular. And it's uh, difficult to keep up with places for us to offer that. Um, 
And we also have a SWIFT program uh, through the Nick Smith Center and Seniors Without Walls. If you aren't familiar with that, it really is a telephone service to connect seniors um, to sports chats, to um, news. So people can all join basically on one party line. And so for those people who were uh, affected during the pandemic, couldn't get out, that was a way to stay connected. So that's just a few things. Um, there, there's our November calendar, and at the bottom it just talks about uh, the men's shed operates two days a week um, on Neiman Drive, and um, that's about it for now. I can't, yeah, local talent. So we always try and engage with locals uh, to offer programming, instruction. Some of it is volunteer, but mostly uh, we do pay our instructors. So the community garden um, has been a really interesting project. It was something that the R Park Rayside Seniors at Home um, took care of, and they weren't able to maintain it. And so Salt um, uh, is now looking after the community garden. It really needed a lot of TLC. It was a piece of property. Um, it's part of the Galilee Center. And it was ours to uh, cultivate, to look after, to find the gardeners. And really, um, this past year, it has gone from um, just dry dirt and weeds to a real garden with elevated gardens um, for people who need uh, accessibility that way to be able to garden. And those projects were taken on by our men's shed. And so right in the middle of town, this is really something for us to have. Um, other communities don't really have something like this, so it's very special. Um, they give their excess produce to the food bank, and it, again, it gives that opportunity to be social, get to know your neighbors, um, and we know that gardening is just good for mental overall health. So we have uh, different bands. Music is... Um, one of the most popular sessions at SALT. We have a SALT band, we have our pug band, which is a ukulele band, um, mostly made up of ladies. And we have a songwriter circle that is just starting on Friday. We also look at special days like St. Patrick's Day um, to host music at SALT. And during the summertime, we have three sessions down at the park. The deal up, I'm sorry. I'm not even pressing the button. You're doing a great job. Um, so I mentioned the Euchre Bridge and Cribbage. Um, there's been a lot of research done actually with bridge uh, around healthy brain aging. And what they're saying is that when you provide um, a place for people to play cribbage and they're social, it actually um, has better effects on brain health. So there's a lot of um, interesting studies coming out right now about um, those things that are going to keep your mental sharpness and your reasoning, your problem solving, even patience when you have to wait and understand and learn a game. So these are things that seniors aren't afraid of and um, they keep asking for more. Six-handed euchre, for example, and, and other games that we haven't heard of. I don't know what Mexican train about. Dominoes <laughs> is, but it must be fun. Um, and so Participant Action Canada um, also supports uh, regular physical activity as not a nice to have for those who can afford it, um, but rather a necessity of life. And that's been our goal at SALT to offer low cost or no cost programming to seniors to remain um, active in their community, to be involved, uh, to combat loneliness and isolation. We know that uh, the research right now is telling us that people who are isolated, um, it, it, the health risk is that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And so loneliness and isolation are two things that we really want to reduce um, to ensure that we have an age grounded community here. We received special grant funding to host <laughs> some Indigenous um, programming and we had, had people from, I have to get the name right, the um, Indigenous Elders and Knowledge Keepers from the Circle of Turtle Lodge in Golden Lake to provide some education around reconciliation this year. 
and this was called a, a blanket exercise. I'm not sure if anybody here was there, but there was a lot of people in the community attended that. Bus trips are not, <laughs> we've had two in the past few months. Um, obviously, COVID has put a damper on some of the travel, um, but we do have some guidelines in place. We do um, take advice from Renfrew County Public Health to ensure that everybody's as safe as possible. New programs for 2023, uh, Karen alluded to this as well. We partnered with the library for a tech savvy program. And so what this is, is um, funding for people that have little or no knowledge of technology. And we have purchased Chromebooks. So we have an instructor who will provide uh, eight weeks of instruction to these people. It's going to be sustainable in that the Chromebooks will live at the library and be signed out um, through them. So they will be keepers of technology. I mentioned the writing workshop. So that's something um, for people who want to try writing, maybe their own bio um, or books. I'm not sure when that starts, but I believe it's January. We have different meditation, acoustic song circles, and Hey Go. I don't know if you've heard of Hey Go, but basically you are connecting to a travel, um, someone who's doing a guided tour across the world in real time. And so you're watching them walk down the streets and you can say, hey, tell me what you see. And um, they will speak back to you. So that's something we offer. <clears throat> hearing tests, again, nobody wants to uh, suffer hearing. Hearing loss, because we also know that that can affect how, how social people stay with their friends and family. Manshed. I'm sure everyone is aware we have a wonderful manshed here. We have about 30, 30 members right now and um, growing. The men's shed, uh, as I said, is two days a week. And so it's community-based, non-commercial, open to all men. And it's really something um, to see the support that they get from each other and to learn new skills, but you don't have to know woodworking. Uh, there's always something for people to do. And um, when we think about men getting together, the reality is many men don't have a lot of adult relationships. And um, to have that support uh, through retirement, loss of spouse, through health issues, it's been really helpful um, to see that support in the community. And just some photos there of um, some of the projects, getting ready for the craft show um, and some walking sticks. So that was um, interesting. It was through the children, uh, what children's age, ch um, well, I guess that's right, the children, Redford County Children and Family Services. So teenagers came and made walking sticks. They learned how to carve and their caregivers also came um, and did another session, just another session, just to to get out, uh, to be around other people, to be around other caregivers, um, and supported by the men's shed. This past year, we had a special grant actually for the men's shed, and uh, we were able to purchase a lot of equipment. As you can imagine, it's very expensive um, to have woodworking um, materials but also the equipment needed to make things. We too are looking for volunteers. Um, we're very flexible, application form, vulnerable sector check to work at the SALT itself and uh, great orientation. Um, we have just had two volunteers start. So we're starting to see people come back. Our budget. Um, Let's see that here on your screen. And for our request this year from the town, we are asking to maintain our in-kind donations of $5,000 and increase the dollar amount to $15,000 for a total of $20,000 this year. You're seeing um, an increase in rent, um, instructor fees, just usual inflation that everyone else seems to be encountering right now. 
we have two part-time staff. Um, and again, hopefully we're going to get more volunteers to help us out to uh, maintain all the programs that we have running currently. So thank you. Um, last but not least. <laughs> Questions? <clears throat> One of your slides, Judy, said that municipalities are mandated to, to pay, I think it's 20% yes. of the operating budget. Yeah. Does that equal what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Um, expenses for sure. Um, We've noticed since last year, like I said, the instructor's cost, but it is a uh, requirement from the municipalities in order to have a salt. A minimum of 20% in cash or in kind. Thank you. No other questions? Thanks, Jim. Very much appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. And the public, do you want to just no public. No public. I think we're good. Do you want to wrap up, Jennifer? Yes. Um, I'm just kind of reiterating what I mentioned before. What I'll do for council is I'll combine all of the requests from all of the organizations. I'll put it in some sort of memo format or something for council, and it'll form part of. Um, I'll make sure it forms part of the budget binder, part of the budget considerations for council to have that information. Any more questions? Or decisions? When you're making that chart, could you? Put last year's yes. request so that we can do that comparison. Yeah, I'll try to gather any information. I think a couple want to see like comparators, card years, and things like that to put the information as well. Thank you. And, and if Council has any questions about any of the presentations you saw tonight that, that maybe you just think about after the fact, if you could funnel them through Jennifer to ask the organization the question and get an answer that she can then. Include in the menu, 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 memo, or at least make sure all the council hears the answer. That would uh, that would be appropriate as well. So, Jennifer, on your uh, report, or your findings, could you put, or will you put, the uh, if everything was granted tonight, what the percentage would be for our tax rate to go up? Absolutely. Different sure. options we can do, please. I'll Thank show you, you what the equivalent tax rate percentage would be. Okay. Yeah. But. Just a thought on that too, because I was thinking that as everybody was asking for more, um, our tax base is more this year too, though. So, I mean, there's also that balance as well, right? Absolutely. And I think when council sees in combination with the whole budget, and yeah, fits in with the whole picture, then it, it helps yeah. paint that whole picture for you. Exactly, because we have more tax dollars. So, it might not mean a percentage. Oh. Any other questions for Jennifer or staff? Yes, Mayor. Um, now, the I, I understand there were some problems with streaming over to YouTube um, tonight, but this was recorded. And the reason I'm asking is that some of the I couldn't see the presentations that were being made on the screen um, from my end. Uh, most of them seem to follow in sequence. Like I've got the agenda in, in their presentation, but the airport, for example. The airport doesn't have, um, I have their financials, but I don't have his presentation per se. So I'm okay to watch it on YouTube if we're confident that it's going to be there. Otherwise, will there be, um, can we get that slideshow uh, from them? Absolutely. So we'll make, we'll make sure that the presentation, which is being recorded right now, um, gets posted. And we'll also make sure, as Marie mentioned, that all presentations that came in just for tonight and we'll get attached to the mix as well, so you'll have access to all of them. Will the general public get that as well, though? Well, they can go on. They go online. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, Madam Mayor? Huh? Uh, confirmatory bylaw, please. The bylaw number 7340 22 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the special meeting of council held on December 7th, 2022. It is hereby enacted. Moover, Councillor Burnett, seconder, Councillor Cooper. All in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. And the adjournment, please. That's a special meeting of council. We adjourned at 8 45.
Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Grimstead, Councillor Denault, <coughs> in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you.